Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty, and I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan Moriarty. Dagan, how are you today, my friend? Hello. Welcome to Steli, everybody. Oh, oh, offensive right I, out the gate. I, I hate like it. it. I hate it, dude. I fucking hate it so much. I just don't. I can't with that. I've given it to the audience. I'm not even saying it anymore. Well, I say it with the audience in discord, but I don't prod it to you, Colin, because I know they've got it covered for me. Yeah, well, I just to me, I feel like. uh, I'm, you know, Michael will appreciate this in hockey. You usually put like Y at the end of people's names or EY, right? Um, And so like Constellation would be Connie, you know, (laughs) which I would be Uh, much better, which I would find a lot better than Steli. Connie Mac, you know, like that's the way it goes. Oh, you know, oh, you know, Connie put a few, put a few hard minutes for us in the third period out there and really grinded, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so that's that's kind of where I am on the name. But introduce our other people. Then I want to tell you something that I had a thought of for sponsorship. But first, let's introduce everybody. OK, yeah. a okay. little bit of a non sequitur, but I mean, that's fine. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, I want to no, I want to no, tell you, but I don't want to okay. interrupt the intros. All right. Uh, yeah. Dustin Furman, executive producer. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I would say I'm feeling fresh, but I'm not. But I'm I'm feeling good. I'm excited about the topics because I think there's a lot of good stuff we can get into. But last we got in yesterday because we spent a little extra time in um, Houston, which was nice. I'm very glad we got to do that. But it kind of is one of those things where it kind of just like shot right back into reality. And so like last night, the thing my parents flew separately from us. So we got to the airport and then we had to wait two hours for them to show up. So then because they were the ones with the car and we all drove together to the airport. So it was just like w- waiting around at an airport when it's kind of like kind of getting late eight or eight or nine, particularly the Pittsburgh one liminal space vibe, very eerie. A lot of places mm. closing. No, very few people yeah. around, but I'm glad to be back. It's that, that first time, you know, sleeping back in your own bed after being gone for a few days, using your own shower, maybe even your own toilet. Uh, all Hopefully. good feelings. I like taking a shit in my own toilet. It's very empowering. <laughs> yes. you know? I get nervous when I travel because, you know, you never, never know when it's going to come up. I pooped right before we went on stage. There's a little bit of a nice. I remember that. Yeah. For you. I went right. I went right in there and pooped right before we went on stage. Not it wasn't like overcoming me. I was just like, you know, I feel it like it, I, I'm mm. like a third of the way there. I got to just get this out. You know, and I just mm-hmm. went in and fucking pushed that bad boy right out of there. <laughs> you don't want a turtle head right for a show. No, no, no. Because I was like, That's I don't not- know. What am I going to do? I'm going to get up and be not- like, I got it. I'll be back. I got to poop. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot. I forgot that we had an intermission, though, so I, I probably could have held it till then. Uh, finally, Michael Watson, the fiance. How are you today? I don't like calling you that because no, it, I hate it. Yeah, I don't like the word, first of all, but I also don't want you to like you're my fiance, but that's not what you're known for. I don't want that to be your. It's not like we're in 1955. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. And Mrs. You know, uh, so but you're our coordinator and shopkeep. And your own independent person. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, as Dustin said, glad to be home. Glad to be shitting in my own shower again. It's, yeah. uh, it's a good feeling. Hell yeah. It's very, good to be, it's very good to be back. Well done. Waff, waffle stomping. Hell Ooh, yeah. Though. Dude, oh. that's a real thing. <laughs> real thing. No, it's Don't ask me how I know. Yes, it is. I can tell no, you how real. I know. Holly, uh, when she went, she went to uh, a Grove City College, which is a place here in... Uh, Western PA area, very pretty conservative Christian. Not the most. It's not like they're wearing jean skirts or anything like that, but more on that side. They probably, I think they have a statue of Ronald Reagan there. Anyway, they had to put up signs about, like, they had to have a talk with people in a hall because there was a girl who was shitting in the shower and stomping it down. (laughs) They had, like, Holly was like, this is a legit thing. They needed, like, they didn't know who did it, but they needed to tell everybody, hey, Whoever's Wapple stomping, stop it. She brings up a lot of questions. Like, why is this someone that was so had such level of anxiety about being around other people or, or, or pooping in an area where you might not be fully private? They felt that the only place they could do it was in the shower. Maybe it was a kinky thing. 
I don't know. Oh, Hard to say. Man. A lot of rep- uh, Christian repression going repression. on. Yeah, yeah. You know, internal. Maybe that's oh, how they got man. it out. Okay. I've shit in the shower before. Stomping it down. Like uh, I've shit in the shower before. But it's not. Uh, but I didn't shit like full on shit. What happened was, I'll tell you right oh, now. Okay. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Please. Is that like before Please. I I get colonoscopies sometimes and endoscopies and you have to clear your system out. Mm. So oh. and I think I've gotten into this before. So you take and I sh- I, I shit you not. No pun intended. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you take a comical amount of laxatives. Like you take probably, I would say no fewer than five, six or seven layers of laxatives. Like you are shitting just pure water. Nothing's even coming out of you, but water by right. the end. And yep. I would get into the shower at that point because it would like, you know, I'd be getting ready to go. Cause at that point you're getting up the next morning and you're pre- pretty much going to do your thing. I'd get it done early in the morning. So you'd fast the day before and just do all this. And by that point, you're just basically, it's like you're peeing as a girl. I would imagine it's just coming out of your bottom region. You're just kind of falling out, you know, <laughs> and call it pissing out so, your ass. <laughs> so I consider that pooping in the shower uh, because that, but okay. it would, because dude, it's not, it's for anyone out there, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. It's wild. It's a wild time when you're, when you're doing this, you, it's wild scary stuff. too, because you know, it's coming. Like, you know, you have to do it. You have this date. Yeah, that you sucks. have to go do this. So the day before you have to cleanse yourself and they give you it's like they give you a thing like here's a list of all the things you need to go get. Yeah. And and take them in this particular order in this cadence. And boy, oh, boy, I'll tell you what that bl- blows a hole out of your ass. Another one. <laughs> another hole out of your ass. Yet another one. All right. Well, welcome to Constellation. Isn't that nice? This it's is our conversational. Nice. This is our conversational podcast. Uh we do each and every week. You can get it a, a week early and ad free over on Patreon at patreon.com slash last day media. Thank you so much for your love, kindness and support. Could not do it without you and uh, all these wonderful stories that we tell you and regale you with, <laughs> such as when I take laxatives <laughs> before I get my endoscopies. Guys, I wanted to frame this episode. I don't really want to theme our episodes per se, but I, I gave everyone a little bit of a challenge for this one, which was could we talk about topics that in some way relate to the Houston show. And why, by that, I didn't mean like we're going to talk about doing the show or we're going to talk. Uh, what I mean is like, what is what is a topic that came up or would somehow be associated with your experience of doing our live show in Houston, which was a great success. And I thought it would be a good way to promote the show coming to Patreon, which it will soon. Um, and that will be fun to see on video for everyone. So I thought this would be a cool way to just talk about the show and our experiences with the show, but also frame it around topics that would otherwise be agnostic, but are somehow still related. So I think you guys will understand, will understand as we go through the show, you'll have already seen the topics if you have seen the, the uh, title of the show and are listening to begin with. But since I want to do things most um, linearly, I guess, Dustin, we're actually going to start with you because your, oh. your ch- topic is most on the nose. And then we'll right. get more and more um, mm. ph- philosophical from there so hit us with your topic number one sure so my topic is about meeting the listeners in real life and so obviously there was a lot of this in houston but i was curious about uh, everyone's experiences about maybe meeting listeners out in the wild because this is a question that i get very very commonly people ask me all the time about what that experience is like and I don't know. I, I won't speak for you guys, but for me, people ask me that. And I think it's it's nice. It's very kind. There are people like, oh, do people recognize you when you go to the store and stuff? And I'm like, uh, slow down. Like this is a I, I get it's we're it's awesome. We are very successful in our field. We have a ton of support and we really appreciate that. But we're we're no kind of like podcast stars by any means. Like uh for for example, I've only been recognized for being uh, a part of the show or any of our shows twice out in the wild outside of a gaming event we'll say because those don't really count for me it's more um like you know when you're either at the store or random place one of them was uh in my hometown i was out trying to find retro games at yard sales and i was at like this company rummage sale and i i met a couple there that didn't live too far away which was weird because i didn't I it's one of those things where living in this small town, I wonder sometimes I'm like, does anybody know about us at all here? Which I found out there are a few. There's a guy in our discord and then I've like, the person I met. Um, but and then the other time that was really funny was at the Paul McCartney concert where we were leaving 
And it was one of those moments where I was walking beside someone. Suddenly they like looked to their right and realized that it was me. And then we stopped and had a great conversation and stuff like that. But it's always, uh, you know, a fun, the, the two times that, that that's happened has been a, a fun shock almost just because it's what I've told Holly before and told people in my family. It's like, cause I've been asked, they're like, are you like famous on the internet or something like that? I'm like, no, uh, I'm like considered mildly famous, a bunch of small niche group of nerds that like PlayStation. And that's like, or in certain scenarios. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really it. But I always think it's a, a fun experience. And it's one that's interesting for me from being on the other side. In fact, I've told the story many times about me and the times I've met Colin way before we were connected professionally at all. So it's like, I know what it's like to be, nervous to to talk to somebody that you maybe feel like you have a connection to but they don't know you at all and i also am just like nervous to talk to people i don't know ever anyway so that's like another layer on top of it so but it's one of those things where i don't know how you guys feel as well but like i can there's been a couple times when we've been at different fan events where i can tell that someone like wants to talk to me i'm like thinking like don't just just do it like you don't need to feel weird or Nervous. anything right 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 i i've heard a couple times this weekend people like man it's so i and i think even at our vip thing there was a lot of people that are like it's so surreal to be here and i guess that is true and that it's surreal and that if you listen to you know three or four voices in your ears once a week for three hours for the last three years and then you're hearing them in real life that would be a surreal experience but it's uh uh yeah it's it's one of my absolute favorite things about doing events is is getting uh this is gonna sound creepy but i'm, I'm just gonna go for it anyway some hands-on time uh with the audience <laughs> oh. you know a little, a little hands-on a little handsy just because <laughs> it is really easy to get wrapped up in comments all the time like i'm always reading patreon comments and youtube comments and i'm sure people have heard people talk about this before but you get it's really easy to get fixated on some bad ones. It's, it's incredibly easier. If someone, you know, says like you said this, or you came off this way and you're like, I don't think I did that at all. I wasn't, that wasn't my impression at all. And you get really like fixated on it. And, you know, we've, I think all gotten pretty good at getting um, thick skinned and kind of letting that stuff like bounce off. But every once in a while, something will bother you. But when you go to events like this, it's, it becomes much easier to realize that it's like, no, you got to ignore those assholes because there's so many people that it's, we're in such a blessed position to have this level of support and people that want to come out and hang out and um, enjoy, enjoy a, a fun evening with us. And so it's like the ultimate morale boost, at least for me, it's like you, it's, you go and you re we're recording a podcast right now. We're all alone in our individual rooms and now Ben and I will, you know, boop around on the computer and then hit upload and then it just gone and just out. And then we read small snippets of text about what what people thought about it, good or bad. And people can write a text that says how how awesome or how good it is that they had that for on their way home from work or when they're delivering stuff UPS or whatever. And that's all that's cool. And it's not to say that those aren't meaningful, but shaking someone's hand and talking to them for a minute about their experience with the show and stuff like that is just on a totally different level. So to throw this over to you guys, I'm curious, first of all, if you've had, yeah, uh, I guess good or bad. Cause I think I'm, I'm really curious about you, Colin, cause uh, you've been in the game, you know, longer than any of us. I'm sure you've had some really weird fan interactions that were maybe weren't so good. And I'm sure you've had some that stick out and are really memorable that maybe made a big impact on you. So I'm curious about that aspect. And then if, we, if you want to talk about Houston, that's cool too. I know it's not specifically framed about that, but um, yeah, a lot of different areas we can jump in. Yeah. So I agree with your statement. First of all, that doing live shows, this was always true for me, even when I was at beyond and PS, I love you, which was, they just remind you that everyone's real. There are times where I look at, I look at our numbers and I look at Patreon and I, look at this the reality of my situation and i'm like is this real or is this some sort of ruse like some sort of complicated yeah. shrewman show style <laughs> thing where it's like no one gives a fuck about colin colin doesn't make this much money colin doesn't have this many patrons colin doesn't have this company it's just all this fake facade 
and everyone around you is part of the production but you. And this, and by the way, you should watch The Truman Show if you haven't seen it. It's, it's actually, I think, a pretty powerful film. So excellent. Um, and so I feel like that when I interact with people in person, which doesn't happen very often, and it didn't happen very often back in the day too, because people weren't coming to IGN and show like that. I was like, we were, we worked in an office. We had like first Fridays or whatever the hell that thing was called where people would come visit or whatever, but, um, and take office tours, but you just, you're reminded and in touch with the fact that it's real. I guess when you work in games media, the, the, what's real are the comments and a lot of the vitriol and the conversation, but also just the sheer amount of numbers. But when you do something smaller for a micro community, you could lose sight of the individual person. And that's that's what I really enjoy doing, um, why I enjoy meeting the audience and why I think, and I said at the end of our show that our audience is just, I think, really special. And I don't say that just to, to blow smoke up everyone's ass. It's It just seems, it's not to say it's unique to us. It just seems like this is one of the communities that seems to be really positive. The gaming community is kind of a, it's kind of like a garbage pail in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of just go- just garbage and trash in it. Just a lot of fucking people that are assholes and aggravating and don't know, and certainly don't know anything about what they're talking about, et cetera, and so on. And I feel like we've just kind of made a barrier around ourselves that precludes people from really getting deeply involved in us unless they buy in. And I don't mean literally, I mean figuratively and just the way we do things, like just the way we treat people with respect that we kind of tell the truth. And you had said earlier, like the only conflict I ever have with the audience members to this day is when they lie. I, anyone can say what they want or feel the way they want. I don't care. And in fact, I feel like I've had, I've never had thicker skin than I do right now. Like I just, it's like, whatever, man, there, it, part of it is just being comfortable to be honest with you. And part of it is just like being, I'm not, I'm not dependent on the people that hate me. I don't give a fuck what they think. It, so it's, it does it, that did hurt me at one time. Everyone's human. There are certain things that would always hurt me. Like I don't, I'm not someone to talk about personal looks or appearances of anyone and and stuff like that. That hurts me to see written or said about anyone, including me. And that's the kind of stuff I take. I don't try to participate in. I've never participated in myself. So like, there's like very, um, very specific buckets where I'd like interact in a negative way with someone if they're saying something bad or something about that. But otherwise, only when people lie about things I've said or done or things we say or the thing like it's like I'll call that out in fucking two seconds and I just did it recently like someone going going insane of saying I'd said this I'm like I definitely didn't say that and we DM privately and I'm like you can go bye I mean like it's I, I have nothing else to say like if you're going to misrepresent me then you don't care about me you don't like me you don't like this content but that's point zero 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 one percent of people that we interact with like people that spoil things and all that kind of stuff like uh, operation jesse or whatever that was we, we did that thing mm-hmm. where that where that guy was spoiling the last of us uh, part sucks. two on our on our patreon what i'm reminded of though and uh, is just how good and decent people are and you said like i've had ba- awkward or bad experiences certainly it's like the reality is is that i've really not had very many awkward or bad i don't think i've had any bad experiences That's like good. no zero yeah. bad experience i don't i I feel like I would remember it. I've met many, many people. The one thing I feel bad about is that I don't, I I have to see you multiple times to really remember you. And I'm probably not going to remember your name. Even when people are like, oh, this is this person from the, the, from the community. This is this person from the community. I'm like, I know the name. And sometimes I know the face, but I often don't put you together, you know? So that's just the way it is. And I'm also not much of a reader of names, even on discord. I just read kind of comments. I don't, I'm not even really reading who's writing them to be honest. I don't know if that's weird, but I'm just kind of like reading what everyone's saying. So I'm kind of absorbing many things. So I will say that I've not had to my mind, anything that I would consider bad. I've had some awkward experiences. Usually people, listen, this is video games, nerd culture. There's a lot of awkward people, a lot of asocial or poorly socialized people. Um, and I don't really get mad about it. It's just, they, they linger too long and their hand is sweaty when they shake your hand or like there's weird stuff like that. But Generally speaking, it's everyone's very friendly and kind. Everyone means well. And it reminds you, too, in my opinion, of while things seem so vitriolic and people talk a lot on the Internet, they talk very little in person. No one's ever said one iota of what they would say to me online to my face. And I've been at all these different events many, 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 many times. And I think that's also a really stark reminder of just the overwhelming positivity, not only in our community, but just generally to think that I, I personally believe most people are inherently good. I've always believed that. And that the loudest and most, most boisterous make things seem unbalanced. And if you focus on those things, you'll, you'll miss the forest for the trees. 
And so these interactions with with um with the fans are 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 gratifying to me. And I'm I'm <laughs> I say I've, I've been saying this a lot lately because I guess this is one thing I am sensitive about is this idea that I'm gruffer than I really am. I'm actually a pretty kind person, like a pretty de- like decent person. I have a persona of being much more like ah and much more aggressive than I really am. And I'm very pleased when people say like, oh, you were so nice and all of this. And I'm like, yeah, thanks, because that's how I want you to walk away from my interactions with me. It's why I don't want to meet certain people. I don't want to ruin that. And I would never want to be the source of ruining someone's fandom by being a dickhead to them. It's just simply that easy. Like, how hard is it for you to just give someone a few minutes of your time? So it's it's just. Listen, people have to go and do work real jobs every day. They're listening to the show by the tens of thousands working real jobs sure. that suck. And I don't work one of those jobs. And I don't work one of those jobs because the people out there choose to support us. So when we meet them, the least I can do is give them my attention and, um, you know, my thanks. And that's what I hope that we're able to do. That's why I really enjoyed our VIP session, actually, was because we were able to kind of interact in a more personal way with people, tell stories and, and anecdotes and kind of just not feel like we're under the gun or somewhere being recorded or someone's trying to get you because you're, you're surrounded by your people and that's, it's comfortable to not, it's not the YouTube comments. I would, by the way, I would love to sit in a room with the YouTube commenters, but they're the cowards, not me, you know? Uh, so anyway, that's how I feel about it. And so I, I've loved meeting the listeners and I'll, I'll say I'm recognized once in a blue moon, no doubt. Um, when when Dagan and I and our sisters and their significant others all went to dinner at a place called Taza in Central Virginia, I was recognized in that restaurant. Forgot about that. Um, Very recently. Yeah. 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 Um, I was like going into the bathroom and I was just holding the door open for the guy as I was walking, you know, walking out, you know, just trying to be polite. And he was just staring at me. That's got to be a trip. And I was like, <laughs> hey, here you go. And he's like, hey, Colin. Right. And I'm like, yeah. And he just like gave me a fist pound, you know, or whatever. And just like went inside. I was like, and that was it. And then I've been in situations like in Santa Monica, especially in L.A. and Santa Monica, because a lot of people would come to visit there. So there's just a churn like if in this area. No one's visiting this place. So you're, you're kind of not yeah. you're not getting like different permutations every day. I had a guy run up to me. Actually, maybe the most awkward interaction I had. It was funny, though, was a dude from like Sweden ran up to me in L.A. and like hugged me. I always talk about this story. Yeah. And that was a little weird just because I'm like, how can you not know me? To think that like. You don't know me very well if you think you should do this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. It is interesting to think they, that he did, but the excitement was just so overwhelming that he had to do it despite right. and he's, whatever and he's repercussion. foreign and he's visiting the US and it's like you don't I'm like, I don't want to ruin your Right. Like, get away from me, you fucking slob. No, <laughs> yeah, that's he, he was actually he was actually cleaner and better put together than everyone else from America there. No doubt about that. The Scandinavians come correct. Um but to me I just uh, <laughs> That that's like as bad as far as it gets. I've also had people threaten me that they were going to do things to me at the shows, but that's never come to fruition. Yeah. You know, like, uh, yeah, I'm going to come to Comic-Con, beat the shit out of you, that kind of stuff. I'm like, I doubt it. Um, don't miss. <laughs> Micah, how is it for you to uh, be with the, the fans and, and meeting fans and, and kind of, you know, gaining fans for the first time? In fact, I uh, where well, not the first time because you have a YouTube channel, too. But I got a message from someone. Um, oh God, I wish I had it on the fly here. They had said something along the lines of, I, I had not been able to, I, I forgot, I, I met Micah at the show and I forgot to tell her that I really enjoyed her stuff. And we're getting comments like that, that people are, are enjoying your inclusiveness and all that and, and, and your, your inclusion, I should say, in this, um, in this group and talking more about games. So it's, it's been probably a newer experience for you. I'm curious how you're taking it. Yeah, I mean, it's really cool, but it is super weird. Um, when Dustin mentions like, yeah, you can, you can tell when listeners are more nervous and it's like, that was me. I mean, it still is because I, I am just a shy person like me working at the merch booth at the live show. I have like a tummy ache for like a week leading up to that because I'm just so nervous about meeting all these people and everyone's like really friendly, which is awesome. And it it does kind of just cement that idea in your head of like, yeah, I like this community is real. And you know, these people in the discord are all real people. But I am incredibly nervous and shy. And it does remind me, though, of moments when I was on the other side of it. Um, I actually remember seeing Colin at PAX several years ago, and I didn't get to meet you, but I was just in the crowd. And I remember thinking like, oh, my God, I'm in this room with him. I'm hearing his voice right into my ears. 
Like I'm not hearing it through a speaker. Like, wow. and I remember thinking this will be the only time I'm ever in a room with this person. Like it was really cool as a listener to be like, this is the one moment I'll ever be in the same room as this guy. And I mean, it was just super cool. And at that same show, you know, ended up meeting like a different podcaster. And I, all I did, I'm very shy. All I did was wave to them because I saw this person in line getting a sandwich. I didn't want to bother him. I was just like, I'm just going to wave, you know, just a little nod. Like I see you. And then he walked over and in my head, I was like, shit, no, no, I didn't want to speak to you. I don't know what to say. I just wanted to acknowledge I'm a fan. And the interaction went fine, but I am just, I've always been a anxious, shy person. I'm not really good at being in the spotlight type thing. And being on this other side at these past couple live shows, having people ask me to sign things is weird. Like it's cool, but it feels bizarre. Um, when we were doing like the signed posters and Ben was like, oh, you should sign these. And I was like, what? Because I didn't even think of it. I didn't think anyone wanted that to be included. And actually, when I'm at the merch booth, someone came up to me, really nice young man, and was like, oh, I wish you had been at the VIP thing. And in my head, I was like, I didn't think anyone wanted to meet me. Like, aside from getting to say hello at the merch table, I didn't think anyone wanted me to be part of that interaction. So it was super cool. It's really, I don't know, it it just reminds me of how much people do enjoy the shows. And it gives me a little more confidence. I've spoken to Colin before about sometimes feeling like I don't really belong in the space, mostly just because I'm like, Look at Dagan, he's an animator, and Colin is like has all this experience. And Dustin had been worked in production before. It's like, you know, these are the perspectives people want. Who wants to hear from me? And getting to chat with the listeners and having them say that, you know, they enjoy like my little stupid jokes and things, or just that they like seeing my perspective on the show reminds me that I do belong here. And that was super important for me. I there was a really nice listener named Nicole that like almost made me cry when she came up to me at the merch table because she was just being so friendly and saying how much she liked seeing me on the shows. And it means the world to me. So these are interactions that, you know, we hang out in the Discord and there's a lot of jokes in there. I, I love the memes channel, of course. And it's an awesome way to interact with the community. But getting to see them in person, seeing their smiling faces and how happy they are to be there, how excited they are. It's it's infectious. And I, I wouldn't trade those moments for as nervous as I am about being in those scenarios. Like the week leading up to the live show, I'm a nervous wreck, partly because of like travel and partly because of just this influx of socializing. And I normally don't. I'm, I'm quite a recluse like Colin is. And then the aftermath of just feeling like that was an awesome experience getting to meet all these people. And I, I wouldn't trade those moments for anything. Like it is just super cool to be a part of and to be you know the behind the scenes person in all this yeah like uh, oh, you sorry. were mentioning uh how you had waved and then they the person whoever this person was came in and talked to you yeah i like to do that to people like i if i see <laughs> someone that i can tell is nervous because here's the thing and i don't know so when that person after you went and talked to them you're like okay that seemed really scary but i'm kind of glad they initiated because now i have this cool memory of this interaction with this person yeah so that's the thing for me is that i'm like mm, okay that person i think i can i can do that for this person because i was once in the position where i was nervous to talk to somebody so i can take that little edge off and just initiate or like try to include this person or do whatever but yeah, maybe there, and maybe there is a little bit of a sadistic asset <laughs> aspect to it where it's like <laughs> i'm gonna catch this person off guard and talk to them and see what they think i saw yeah. someone on the facebook group uh maybe this person's listening now they're like i met dustin outside the hotel and i went for a fist bump and he went for the handshake i want to kill myself <laughs> like <laughs> the awkward interaction i was like i didn't think about that at all but i'm kind of like i'm glad i'm glad that i was just like hey you know i talked to this guy because i could tell he was there to for the event but i find that aspect entertaining from the other side and i think it's a mutually beneficial thing too yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, because I'll, I'll just one final thing, like I'll say there have also been times where I was at like an event like PAX and I did see someone that I really wanted to interact with. and I couldn't just I just could not work up the nerve. There's this awesome uh, cosplayer who cosplays as like Geralt and uh, Arthur from Red Dead 2. Arthur. And I saw him as Geralt and I, I was standing like next to the guy, you know, and, and I just like 
I just so badly wanted a photo with him because he was taking pictures with other people. I just couldn't bring myself to ask. And it's like one of my big regrets because yeah. I love The Witcher and I follow this guy's Twitter for years. And I'm just like, he was right there. There he was. But I couldn't I couldn't do it. So I, you're right. I do appreciate that like this other person did take the initiative to be like this shy young woman clearly would at least like to say hello. Um, Sorry, I, I, I interrupted you guys the last two times I tried to uh to jump back in. I'm used to I'm used to to uh having to steer the conversation, but I don't need to do that so much here. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um so I will say that I not only do I like the reminder that it's real and Dig will get let's get your take on this now is not not only do I like the reminder that it's it's all real, but that it just again, uh, because I don't get much personal interaction, mostly because I Mike and I have been talking about this recently where I my honest opinion, my honest take is that I don't really want more friends than I have or more things to do than I have right now. Like I don't. I really like my being with myself. I like being with like a very small cadre of people. And um and that's kind of like my world. And there's really no no social wants outside of that. There it, there's it's not me hiding anything else. Like I've kind of been burnt in my social past and I'm kind of just more closed and that's just the way it's always going to be and I'm I'm happy with that. But when you're forced out of those positions and then you're kind of put into the good graces of other people and how they treat you and then you get reminded that they're they're really wonderful people, I think that that makes it um much much easier as well. And I also just try to remember that people are it's not only like, you know, a business proposition, it's not like people put their faith in in you that you're going to be authentic. It's important that when you meet them that it goes well. Because anything else is is not good for the product and is not an authentic view in, into the way the product is built, which is on that authenticity. So Dave, I'm curious how how you take it and how things have gone for you, because especially this was a, an important moment, because when we did our first live show, you left before we were able to meet the everyone together. Um, so you were like a, the only person missing when we had our get together the next day. And a lot of people were disappointed about that. So I was happy that you were able to to do this. And uh, I'm curious how you took it and how everything went for you. Well, you know, let me start by saying I like these curated loosely around a common theme episodes. I think this is a nice model for once in a while. I think this is kind of fun. No, thank you. Um, you know what? I actually, my first, well, I only had two fan events so far, the one in Pittsburgh slash Butler, you know, Western PA in Dustin and Ben's neck of the woods. And then the one that we just got off of in Houston. And you know, my first interaction really dealing face to face with people that listen to me regularly was the post show signing. You know, we had the little poster signing in Butler where people, we, you know, I had a line of people coming up to me and having a conversation and taking pictures and signing posters. So that was really surreal. And it taunts on me. That was like, what, a year and a half ago. And it's equally, if not even more surreal to me now, because, you know, it's, it, it's strange for me. Like I still think of myself as, you know, listen, I could, I'm as far from almost famous as humanly possible. Like I already know that, like there's no celebrity to me whatsoever. I really think of myself as like an animator, aging skateboarder from Long Island. That's just a nerd. You know, I, I do this, I do the podcasting because I, just, I love conversation. You know, and I love talking about cool shit and I like weighing in on nerdy stuff that I care about. Like, that's really the reason why I do it. Like, this isn't my livelihood. It may, may never be like a large part of my livelihood. I just really enjoy it. And before Colin and I had that last Jedi conversation five years ago, which kicked everything off, I would have never seen myself doing this as much as I love the art of conversation in front of an audience. You know, I always talk about growing up loving Charlie Rose and Dick Cavett and just two people having an intellectual, passionate conversation about whatever, underline here, anything. It doesn't matter to me. Like as long as somebody was passionate and having this engaged talk about said topic, like I was in. So to be a part of that and for that to mean something to people, even the smallest segment of people is just unbelievable to me like it's incredible that it's kind of that it kind of happens even on this small scale dustin was making me laugh because talk about getting recognized the one time that it happened to me i got mistook for colin in new york oh. i was coming home from work i talk about this story go down to the subway on the other side of the subway platform somebody's yelling at me colin colin 
until I realized he's talking to me. And, you know, I guess we could look alike from afar. Especially I was a little, I wasn't th- quite this thin. Like I had a little more of Collins, not emaciated physique, like whatever that was five years ago or whatever. So just say what you got to say. I'm fat. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but P-H-A-T, not F-A-T. Yeah, right, 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 right. And then I got recognized at a video at too many games. Which, if my friends, if it's not going to be my friends or family, I'm going to get recognized at a retro video game convention once in a while. So I've been to a dozen, and I got recognized once at one. That was that was my 15 minutes, you know. So that that's a foreign concept to me. But I'll tell you, like, and I've only been through this twice. And remember too, like I grew up, and Colin grew up. I I saw Colin go through this from his earliest stages of fame slash internet fame, whatever you want to call it, starting with IGN and then eventually graduating to kind of funny. And of course, lately with last damn media stuff, I've seen Colin recognize on the street in multiple cities. Like I've seen that happen at events or just randomly. So, and that's, that's still like something like you talk about the, the Scandinavian guy in Santa Monica. I love that story. But that must be such a trip. Like that's something I can't really wrap my head around. And also I have to say, I don't know how good I would be with fame, not in embracing it, but just in fe- just feeling genuine humility, like I'm not really worthy of that. And But I, I got to say also though, it's my personality. If you want to hug me, if I mean that much that you want to hug me, I'm hugging you all day long. I don't care where it is or what the circumstances. What if they is. mean? What if they mean so much? Do they want to give you a hand job? I'll take the hand job. Yeah, right, right on. Just a quick I'll one. Yeah, I'll nice. <laughs> we'll, t- we'll tug. We'll tug. <laughs> <laughs> that's gross. Maybe we'll keep it to hugs. All right, that's yeah. fair enough. Or just yeah. over the clothes groping. I mean, whatever you want. Right, right, right. <laughs> never end. I'm not going to grope. I will. Right, right. No, no. Of course, of course, of right. course. So no, I'll keep the hands in my. You're the gropey. You, 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 t- <laughs> you touch on you touch on something interesting, which is um. What do they call that? Um, yeah, imposter syndrome or whatever. I hate when people talk about this and I don't like talking about it because in and of itself makes it when people are like, I feel like I have imposter syndrome. I'm like, for what? <laughs> like, really? Like, you don't understand like, imposter syndrome? No, no, I do. What I'm saying is that like half the people I see say it, I'm like, imposter syndrome for what? Like, oh, because what are you, you're like, what, what are you? What are you doing? That's That makes you feel like you're an imposter. I'll tell well, you, dude, I have that. My, I have that even with animation. Like it's not, and it's not a false modesty. I think it's, I think it's, you know what I think it is? See, I think it's very much a part of being a creative person, you know, and I'm Mm. not ranking myself along the top echelons of being a creative person, wherever that lies with, with a specific human being. Like, I feel like every time I start a new animation job, this has been happening for 25 years that I'm like, they're going to, you know, that whole sensation of they're going to find me out. They're going to know I'm a fraud. I'm going to get, I'm going to try to get ahead of steam and I, I don't really know how to do this. Like it's very atypical for being a creative, but I, I, and I know, listen, we all know people that are falsely modest. You know, that's a, that's a true thing. Yeah, that That's exists. what I'm saying. I feel like there's a connection between impo- saying you have imposter syndrome and false modesty and some. Yeah, some yeah, 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 definitely. But I, you know, I have to say, dude, like, and I witnessed this again in Houston and it's so gratifying. It dawns on me, like I was thinking about this on the flight home. What we do in the podcasting world or YouTube world, whatever you want, however you want to define it, it's typically very one sided on a day to day basis. The fans and the listeners and the watchers know what we sound like, they know what we look like, they know our personalities, they know our likes and our dislikes, they know our sense of humor. But we never get a chance to see them. It's those fan events. That's why it means so much that you orchestrate these things, Kyle. And I, I know how much it means to the people is that now it's a two-sided thing that that wall is removed. I could see what they look like. I could witness you know, their, their sense of fun, their creativity, their sense of humor. I could have an intera- a one-on-one interaction and they could speak to me and I could speak to them. And you know that divide isn't there you know so uh, it's 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 putting a name to a face and you know because usually we're broadcasting these things out to these indiscernible masses that are just like i know you're i know people are listening i know they're watching but you know it's this faceless 
amorphous, you know, entity that that we're broadcasting to. So it's it's really nice to have that personal interaction and you know, be there and and see people and also see what it means to them, which is really surreal. Like it it's unbelievable when you hear like the things we hear at a live show where people will say, you know, I listen with my girlfriend or a husband and wife will say, I listen week in and week out. You know, I'm, we've been doing that for years or I listen at my job and it keeps me going through the day or, you know, I, I'm having a tough week or I had a tough year last year and your podcast really helped me get through and give me some levity and give me a laugh or give me something to think about or a new perspective on Star Wars that I never thought of or a video game. So it's so... That's the reason. Like that is everything. Just to have that interaction and know from the horse's mouth what it means to these people. And also, let's be honest, like the people that come out, right? They take time off from their jobs. They get a babysitter. They hop in the car or they book a flight. They book a hotel for a night or two or three at their cost, their time. They're the ones that are really the fans that the, are the most hardcore and they're showing it with their actions by being there. And it, that's the other thing. Like it was amazing how many people were at this recent Houston show that weren't even from the area. You know, they were flying from Florida. We had guys from Toronto. We had people from the West coast coming from all over the place, right? Coming from other countries. So it means the world and Having the time, it's a great reminder once a year or twice a year to just be able to, I feel like being able to give back, be able to give your time and be able to give something in person, a signature, a few moments to have a conversation, have a beer together, whatever. It's it's just awesome. And it, I think I would enjoy it no matter what, but I think having the opportunity to meet people in person is the cherry on top of the Sunday for me. And, um, you know, it, it still feels like a pinch me thing to me, even though, you know, we could, yeah, we could say we're not red letter media. We don't have a million followers. We don't, you know, but there's a lot to be proud of there and, and the way it's building and a, and a community that's so to a person, I said this coming out of Pittsburgh and I really mean this, like it's not only lovely, and smart and fun and funny and makes me laugh and always have really interesting takes on the various things we talk about, but also just like really polite and, you know, um, very warm and kind and just like to like the community being not only with you guys, I said this to Cog too. I was like, dude, you make me proud to be part of the same family podcasting family because just who he is. He's such a, he's such a class act, right? But I think about that with all the fans too. It's like these people are true. It's truly an amazing community. Like they astound me every time. And I think you could get a taste of that through the interactions through Instagram and Twitter and our DMs and our Discord and everything like that. But seeing it in the flesh is proof positive that this is a really special community, especially for an internet community. Yeah, definitely. And that's, yeah, that I think is a key component. I, Dustin, I want to kick it back to you. I just want to, yeah. I want to say something real quick to get this out of me. I was writing it down. Mm. I had never thought about this before about <laughs> false modesty and imposter syndrome and all of this, but this is how I want to, this is how I want to put it. Now, I wonder, you guys can pull at this if you want later, or you can just leave it be, but um, I know I belong where, doing what I'm doing. I accept that luck and timing played massive um, parts in me getting to this point. And I accept that it could have not happened that way. But I know I worked hard enough and that I knew enough and was talented enough to do it. But sometimes those other components never come into play, which is why I always say there are many, many more talented people than me out there that didn't get the luck or the timing component down. As long as you accept that, I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And, and I become more accepting of that over time. Only when I was at IGN in my earliest days before I was probably promoted out of like associate editor and like kind of being in the pool when I was like, I, I'm afraid I'm going to get laid off or something, but I thought I belonged. I just thought that my card was going to get pulled. It's always like the game of musical chairs, the corporate politics, all the rest. 
But I always had a real feeling of belonging in terms of skill and in terms of knowledge. And I think people need to own that more because it's okay. But you have to accept that you aren't fully responsible for being where you are. That's what modesty is, in my opinion. It's not saying I'm not worthy. It's saying, no, I'm worthy. I'm definitely worthy. But what about luck and timing? That's being modest, in my opinion. Anyway, um, yeah, what, what do you have to say? Yeah, I think that's absolutely a big part of it. And I think that, yeah, the thing that always just feels weird to me is like the the surreal experience thing. I'm like, bro, like I'm I'm just like you think about those experiences and stuff like that when you're like sitting on your couch drinking a coffee and you look like hell. And you're like, there's nothing surreal about meeting me. Trust me. Like, <laughs> oh, <no>. but. <laughs> Yeah, like, it, but people don't see that aspect. You take a dump just like everyone else. You know what I mean? Like, so, but it, it does come into, so the po- imposter syndrome aspect that, I don't know, because I'm thinking of like when I started working for you, Colin, and I think that there was, I don't even know if it was called imposter syndrome. It's like for so long I had worked for the opportunity for for the shot and then you get the shot and you're like, oh, can I do this? Like there's the question that, you know, they're always, and I think that's healthy to like question your own ability and confidence. Like, well, you better fucking do it. Cause this is what you tried. So you do everything you possibly can to make this work out. And I think Colin, that's something you've said about once you get in the foot in the door, you've got to, you got to jump in and never let them let you yeah, out. It's on you, dude. It's on you at that point. I saw a yeah. day. I saw a fraction, dude. I got an email saying, do you want to write a fucking strategy guide for Spyro? Enter the dragonfly. And that showed Oof. like a little sliver of light. And I booted the goddamn door off the hinges. I mean, yeah. it's like, oh, my God, they're opening the door. The door's unlocked. The door's unlocked. And like you fucking like, yeah, totally. You got to take yeah. advantage. Be annoying. Be persistent. I mean, like that kind of stuff. It it works. I mean, I, I, I was the guy that was sleeping on couches. I was the guy that would grind and do anything. And it did work. That's why I get I get so mad when people are like, oh, hard work doesn't there is no meritocracy, all that. I'm like, well, there isn't a pure meritocracy because there are these elements you cannot control, but you can absolutely control yourself and mm-hmm. put yourself in the best possible position. No excuses. And that's that's my honest opinion, because it's worked. It's worked for me. It's worked for people I've loved. It's worked for me over and over again. And I'm not that smart. I'm not that talented. I've known many smarter people than me. I've known many more talented people than me. So, yeah, you're absolutely right, man. I hope that people really take that to heart about just kicking the door off the hinges. And I hope you had a similar experience. But I, yeah. I've never questioned your competence. Thank at you. Because I, I have. I, I mean, I've <laughs> not I, in I, a qu- negative way. Just you know what I mean? I've questioned, you know, I've questioned more more things about myself in, in our relationship and, and in our like, am I, I I'm not a natural boss. I don't think I'm even a natural leader because I'm very passive, you know, um, and that's a real challenge for me. I work with my brother, you know, I work with my fiance, I work with my good friends and it's difficult to do that and to keep like, I want to get, I do get mad sometimes and it always is awkward, you know, and it's awkward when other people get mad and that that's just the, the way it goes. So you have to kind of just navigate around your strengths and weaknesses, but I recognize my weaknesses a great deal. I think I'm a, I think I'm a, I treat everyone fairly and well. From in the most important ways, which I think is personally and financially, but I also give people so much rope sometimes that I think they can hang both of us. And I think that's a dangerous thing. So I, I've, right. I've learned my limitations, no doubt. <laughs> I'll cap us off unless anyone has any final thoughts. Um, two, two small things. It's just, first of all, I know this isn't our Houston recap, but the show was special, at least for me, in that we booked our hotel before we even announced the event. So and we didn't book it right next to the convention center intentionally, or at least I think that was intentional on Ben's part. <laughs> and then seeing the event get announced and having the thing in Discord, we just saw so many people saying they were booking at the same hotel as us. And we were a little at least I was like, hopefully this is cool. You know, like we're kind of we're 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 living together in this hotel with our, our fans for a few days. But um now coming from the other side of that, it was nothing but positive. It was actually, I think, one of the best parts is that I get to have breakfast with some guys or, you know, the one night we're like, what do we do? It's like, well, let's just go down to the lobby and see who's there and then hang out for a bit. Like it was and it was never weird. It was never like too clingy or people trying to like hang like hang out when it's like we got to do stuff. It was it was awesome and it was a really good experience. So thank you guys for that. Can I can um, I speak on that real quick? It, yes, if, yeah. if you don't mind, I, I yeah, wanted to, I wanted it. to say something about this. 
I think that's really cool that people do that. And there's a really specific reason I don't really try to put myself in those positions often is because I feel like the situation becomes captive to me. Mm. And I think that that sucks for everybody, right? Like if, if there are five people that listen to the show and they're like gathered around drinking a beer and then I'm drinking a beer with them, then it becomes about me. When really the, the act of drinking your be- a beer with your buddies is to be, be about the camaraderie and everyone together. And so I feel like there's this, it's, it's just a natural separation between the creator and the person like that of the thing you make and then the, the consumption of that item and kind of treating them like something that's not special to the situation makes it awkward. But then you have to kind of be captive to them. And I just don't like, you know, I, in other words, I don't like it being a, about me. That's why I like the whole like meeting people individually. It's, it's the same thing about dividing and conquering with my friends. Like I'm not one to bring all my friends together. I like having Ramon by himself. I like having Mike Pope mm-hmm. by himself. I like having Doug by himself and then nurturing all these things separately. That way you're not like bringing everyone together and then everyone's looking at you, mm-hmm. you know? And, and that, so that's, that's the reason why I don't do it is to just save everyone from, from the bore and the fucking chore of even having to be in that situation. So just think more of me than you, than, than is real. That's better mm-hmm. for everyone. Right. <laughs> the, the last thing I'll say that I, I just thought of was one sort of fake fan interaction that was really funny that I had not fake fan. You'll know what I mean in a second. When I was at Cedar point, I was wearing my sacred symbols hoodie and I was getting a drink. And the guy at the thing was like, Oh, that's cool hoodie. I was like, Oh, do you listen to the show? He was like, no, but I know it's PlayStation. I was like, Oh yeah. And sometimes when, when stuff like this happens, I'll just act like I I'll, I'll tell them about the show, but I will not mention that I'm on it. I'm like, Oh yeah, it's a, it's a PlayStation podcast. It's a pretty big one. It's got like a, old you know an ex ign guy on it and it's got this youtuber chris ray gun he's like oh that sounds really cool well this other guy in line was like oh that's colin moriarty's podcast isn't it i was like oh yeah yeah it is actually oh wow he's like oh i've i've listened to that show it's really good i'm like yeah it is really good isn't it so yeah i don't know what happened with him and kind of funny i was like i don't know either and then i got my drink and left oh that's funny he just we all know So I was like, did you, well, he might have listened in the early days or something like that before I was on it. But I was like, either he was making that up or he didn't recognize my voice or it was just from the early days. But it was a funny interaction either way, because I like to go stealthy sometimes when I can. So that was fun. I might have been a spy. Oh, right. I didn't right. even think about that. Could have been a spy, man. You know what? Also, like, yeah, yeah, I, I, Colin and I talk about this sometimes. I think Colin's of, of a like mind with this specific thing. Is I have a I'm very careful with the don't meet your heroes thing. Me too. Like there's people that I put on a pedestal, and I could usually gauge what they're. Maybe it's a pro skater, maybe it's a musician, maybe it's a movie star, maybe it's an athlete, a politician, whatever it is. Right, a writer. It could even be a big animator, right? Like I could usually ascertain what their personality is going to be like, and if I should endeavor to meet that person and if because I'm I would just be so heartbroken and crestfallen if the person was a dick. So what I get from a lot of these people is that they're so courageous. Now I, I know I'm way down here like just above like their coworkers that they see every day, right? But still like they're they're coming out and you know approaching me and they want to have a conversation and want to have something signed or they want to just chill for a bit like that i'm it's not lost on me that that takes a little bravery because who the fuck knows like i could be a total dick to you you know what i mean like and that you know you may or may not have certain levels of thick skin but you know i don't want to break anybody's heart so the la- that's a horrible horrifying thought for me is that uh an interaction with somebody didn't go as well as they wanted you know, Indeed. so I'm Indeed. very mindful of that. And I'm really mindful of how much courage it takes to just do that with anybody that you admire, you know, Definitely. or look up to, or, it's, you know, they, what they do means something to you. I've only waited in line to meet someone one time, and it was Dredge when I was in college. Oh. And uh, at, at Strawberry Music, they played up like a like a random acoustic set. And I met them and I, I became friend, personal friends with the bass player since then. He's the one that does some of the art in my house. So awesome. And uh, that's so I'm one for one with that. 
and I used to wait outside of Nassau Coliseum after Islanders games to just try to meet random players. And sometimes you get like random signatures of like, you know, third line left wing and shit like that. But it didn't really work. So, I, yeah, I just I'm, I'm the same way. I've, I've stayed away from it. But, um, yeah, I don't want to be I don't I don't want anyone to to think less of me either. I'm paranoid of like I want the listeners to like me, you know, and I don't mean all <laughs> listeners. I mean, like our listeners, our people. Yeah. I want right. our people to like me. And they really like me. They really <laughs> like me. What's that from? Sally Fields. Sally, Sally Fields, Fields, right. Right, right, right. Very well done. Well, Micah, speaking of you, let's go over to you for your topic. I think that in sequence, this one makes sense for us to speak about next. And so I leave Absolutely. it to you. Absolutely. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about packing for a trip. I'm not someone who travels very much. So for me, the act of packing a bag for the trip is it's one of the high points of anxiety for the entire excursion because you, you can't start too early. Uh, leading up to this Houston trip, you know, I am checking the weather in Houston and getting an idea of how warm it's going to be. But I don't want to pack a bag a week in advance only to, to realize, oh, the weather has changed. Now I need to take all those clothes out, pack differently. And I just seem to always get it wrong either way. And I really did not anticipate how warm it would be. I checked the weather the day before we left. I still somehow brought, I was, you know, brought clothes that were too warm for the season, was not anticipating it to actually be 80 degrees. Maybe I just didn't believe it when I saw the weather app. But just in thinking about packing, I am curious what you all do for your method of of getting ready to go, because I used to be the travel size person of like, I'm going to go to Target, go up to the fun little section of miniature items, and I'm going to get everything I need, the mouthwash, the toothpaste, everything. And I've evolved as I've gotten older and maybe a bit more frugal to now I use the reusable travel size bottles. I fill them myself with the soaps and everything. But I, I also know people like, um, maybe you just say, I'm just going to use whatever they have at the hotel. Like maybe I'm not even going to bring, you know, soap and raw shampoo and I'll just say, yeah, maybe I'll just raw dog <laughs> <the trip." laughs> and not bring anything. And, and then there's always the eternal debate on, you know, carry on versus checked bag. Because when we were at the Houston airport, I witnessed a family that had five carry on bags. And as soon as they announced it was time to start boarding, these people were like ready to go. Because as Colin pointed out to me, like you got to get that overhead bin space. Yeah, I had a and lot of I had a lot of meta com- I had a lot of meta commentary for you uh, yeah. during the, during our our travels. Yeah, <laughs> <Sorry. Go ahead. laughs> well, I'm I'm not really much of a traveler. I've flown maybe four or five times my whole life. Like this, oh, it, wow. it's not been many. So I just haven't gone many places. And yeah, watching these people like kind of jockey for position because they want the overhead bins and. In my head, I'm like, I avoid that completely. I bring my personal item bag that fits under the seat ahead of me. And Colin and I planned in advance on sharing a suitcase, which had its own problem. I'm not trying to throw Colin under the bus, but when it comes to like how we packed. So I I had said in advance, like, I want us to pack lightly because if there's leftover T-shirts, my goal is to fit them in the suitcase. Uh, and we filled that fucking suitcase, though. Like, <laughs> I brought one sweatshirt for the whole trip, and Colin's like, I'm going to bring three. And I was just, as soon as he said that, I was like, the the idea of putting anything else in this suitcase on the way home is moot. That's not happening. You know, it's just not going to happen. But it's our different styles of prepping for the trip of, like, I tried to bring the bare minimum, whereas Colin, though, was more practical in a sense of, like, well, I'm going to be ready for anything. You know, I brought one thin sweatshirt and regretted it the whole trip because well, it was so thin I was cold. I should be specific about I should about, have brought the other one. I should be specific that I am typically a very light packer as well. And I think I did light, light pack light other than bringing multiple sweatshirts. But I brought those multiple sweatshirts because I didn't know I was going to be so hot inside. And I was going to wear one sweatshirt <laughs> during the meet, the the VIP session. And then I was going to wear another one on stage. But I wore neither of them because it was just too hot inside. So I want to be clear if I wouldn't have brought those if not for that, for that very specific reason. And then I would have just had a, a couple pairs of jeans and like a few T-shirts and underwear and socks or whatever. I mean, I appreciate that, but I, I am a I am a pretty light packer because I, I was writing that down. I was going to say, like, I actually think I'm a pretty decent packer because I just don't wear anything but T-shirts, <laughs> sweatpants. Like I don't, I don't have like multiple <laughs> pairs of shoes or anything. You know, I'm, I'm not like getting too crazy with that. I usually have my own little rolling bag that I bring bring with me but i didn't we didn't do that this time i'll do that next time so i can avoid ridicule 
Daryl. No. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I was going to kick it over to Dagan unless you want to say something else. No, I was no, just saying, no, I was yeah. just giving an O. Well, oh, okay. Dag. <laughs> oh, I yeah. I mean, listen, as soon as Micah emailed this, I said, yeah, you know, the first thought was there's something so elegant and fun about the idea of packing lightly, you know, just enough, have everything covered, but with no excess. Kind of shows like the experienced traveler, right? Smart. You could be agile, nimble. I don't think I'm very good at that though. And then the other strategy that you guys are thinking about, you know, have all your bases covered, you know, have the extra bathing suit, prepare for rain or shine, warm or cold. There's something smart about that too. It's like, let's just, you know, let's, we're going to pack heavy. We're going to have a bag or two to check. It's not George Clooney and up in the air, you know, the veteran traveler that's on a plane every week, but there's still something kind of smart about that. I'll tell you why I was laughing at this though, is because like you, Micah, the anxiety starts to kick in before the trip. So a week or two out, I'm already packing in my head. Like, okay, like don't forget, like you need a couple of knit hats. You need a couple of bathing suits. Have a couple of comfy sneaks. Like, oh, I want my Vans, but I want like a pair of Sauconies too, just for walking around the city or whatever. And I'm very prepared. And then I pack and I remember everything. And I think I'm doing great. And I'll get, I'm famous for this. I'll get to my destination and I did everything to a T and said, I, but the one caveat is I forgot all of one thing. Like I forgot to, I remembered all the extra boxing sh- boxer shorts, sneaks. I got jeans, I got shorts, but I forgot I didn't pack any socks whatsoever. Like I showed up at Disney World at least once for a week or nine days, whatever we're staying for. No socks. Had to buy all socks. I didn't remember one pair of socks besides what was on my feet. I've done that with boxer shorts. I've done that. I do that on almost every trip. Like I'll forget everything of one thing, one very important thing. And then the other thing that occurred to me was like, I could be pretty flexible with traveling. I like traveling. I could be out of my element and just kind of get hip to a new environment and wearing whatever. But one thing I need to pack if I'm staying anywhere besides home is a pillowcase. I need that familiarity just for sleeping. It's already going to be a weird bed. Maybe it's comfy. Maybe it's not. The bedding is going to be different. The pillow itself could be different. Give me the pillowcase. That's enough. And if I forget the pillowcase, I put a t-shirt over oh. one of my t-shirts <laughs> over the pillow. I don't know what it is. And it's la- maybe it's a little bit of being skeeved by the pillowcase, but it's more comfort. It's like more like, okay, this feels like home. And also you guys should know, I don't know how much I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I had my security blanket like Linus until I was in college. And the only reason, and I slept with that as like a pillowcase my whole life. So through high school. And the only reason I got rid of it in college was because my roommate threw it out. Oh, no. On who I grew up with, by the way got mad at me. We got into like this feud and he threw it down the garbage chute of our apartment complex. <laughs> Herb, my, my uh, security blanket's name was Herb. That's brutal. And uh, Uncle Mike bribed me various times over the course of my life to get rid of Herb. Like here's, you know, I'd be like 14 hanging out for a family dinner. He's digging. Here's 50 bucks. Get rid of Herb right now. I'd be like, no way. <laughs> like there's no way. But so, so that pillowcase t-shirt thing may play into the security blanket thing, which I just kind of realized, but that's really my story with that. That's usually Helene's job is to like, all right, like I know knucklehead forgot like all of his pants and I'm <laughs> like, I need, I'm the t-shirt guy, right? Like I bring more than enough t-shirts. If there's any excess, it's always like, I don't know what graphic T, you know, someone at the door, I think old. I'm going to go get it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Who is at the, the Moriarty oh. home on a, yeah, on I a hear Monday. The dogs barking. Yeah. That's weird. It's so weird for anybody to knock on a door. Ever. I swear to God, the neighborhood kids will sometimes like ring the doorbell because like I threw my Frisbee in your yard and it's like. Oh, that not. type of thing. And they've done it like three times in like one <laughs> week. And it's like, please <laughs> aim the other way. Stop. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you, yeah. Gotta get a, you gotta get a ring. You can see or some, I guess you guys have cameras. Yeah. He's um, got like yeah. Scarface. You could, they got like Scarface cameras set up everywhere. Dude, like, he's got to get yeah. a line into the studio so he can see the entire. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Entire yeah, house. panic room situation. 
Dude, the okay. So I have a ring, which I know some people don't like because it's Amazon and stuff with like they give stuff to police, whatever. Oh, I always forgot. Go that. ahead, leave your comment, whatever. I don't, I'm, I don't care. But <laughs> I've had gotten so many funny things on my ring that is infinitely worth having for that alone. I once had a kid that ran up to my porch, pressed the doorbell, and then ripped ass and then ran away. <laughs> that is amazing. I was like, dude. This is the one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Give him credit. I think I what I I think I posted on Twitter, but I like heavily blurred it so people couldn't see my porch and stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna just see if I can find it. But I was like, man, that is like the best type of prank because that's not yeah. bad. He's he stopped me from whatever I was doing to look at my phone, and then I just have like an eight year old farting on my porch and running away. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, dude, he got me. He got me real good. Some and I'm laughing. It was a good ditch. time. Yeah. Yeah, right. So. Exactly. Yeah. That's a ding dong ditch with like substance. Yeah. I like that. You got to, yeah. yeah. You want to be aggravated, but you got to kind of tip your cap. A- oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, so who was what's it? Going on? What happened? Oh, it was just one of the neighbor kids. I knew it. Fuck yeah. them. <laughs> oh, they're very nice. But I just, uh, he threw, they threw their football over our fence. See? That's what Micah just it. said. Micah I said, it. I was like, they're always throwing that fucking frisbee in our yard. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, uh, they're fine. They're very friendly. But the, my annoyance is like you got to be taught when someone doesn't answer the door after you ring it once, go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't yeah, ring like it people again. are working. You don't from ring home. it again. Don't just ring it until I come downstairs. Football. Just lay on it. <laughs> bring, bring, bring that football. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I missed whatever was being said, but I, I, I thought I heard that, and then the dogs were freaking out. I didn't know if it was coming through. No, nah, I didn't hear the dogs. <sighs> well, fair enough, my friends. All right. So, what are we talking oh, about here? Packing. Oh, yeah. Packing, yes. All right. Yes. Who's who's up next for this uh, packing topic? Either I have something to say, but no, you, you go ahead, Dustin. So packing for me has been really interesting because there's uh, a lot of different scenarios, very specifically like with gear. Gear is a big thing and always is a part of packing for me that makes my life really, really annoying. And I can't stand recently that certain TSA checks you can get randomly in the in the scan that you don't need to take out anything with a screen sometimes you do and for some reason these people at tsa uh act like you should know the difference all the time on whether you do or don't need to take something out and they very clearly let you know sometimes tsa very nice Mm -hmm. sometimes not in fact i will say this time great experience with tsa overall i think they're getting better actually yeah i I think they are too but I, i was lucky i didn't have to take out my screen that's Taking out screens for me is tough because in my backpack, I've got my MacBook, I've got my iPad, I usually have my Switch with me, and then sometimes in the past I've had cameras with me that all have screens on them, so it's like, dude, I'm taking out like 12 things at once. But So gear is always an important thing and a kind of scary thing to travel with because you're dealing with a lot of really expensive equipment that is also very fragile and stuff like that. And so that's always a a big concern. The other thing, too, is that I've been lucky enough to go on some international trips. Uh, Most recently, Ben and I went to Honduras when Ben owned the cigar bar because we got to go to Rocky Patel's estate and do a tour through like tobacco fields and where they make the cigars and stuff like that. Cool. And so where that comes in, Dig, and what you made me think of is that I, through trips like that and going through to the Dominican Republic years ago uh, with my church when I was in high school, was you gotta be care- You can't forget your socks going to a third world country <laughs> like that because you can't do anything about it. Like maybe oh, depending right. on what kind of place you're going to or what you're doing, maybe when you're in the city near an airport or something, you can find a place to buy that. But you're screwed if you don't bring it. We're luckily all the travel I've done recently in the United States, it's like, if you forget socks, you're, you're all right. You can go buy whatever you need Absolutely. and you're, you're going to be all right. As long as it's not like a, you know, your MacBook or something like that is really important. Well, the one funny thing about Houston is that I overall, I, I've become, or I was a light packer to a fault, but it was mostly out of necessity through flying spirit uh, to save money where it's <laughs> like, you don't even get, a carry you have to pay extra for a carry on sometimes all you get is a personal item so it's like wow. fit all your clothes and your computer and your and something whether it's a vita or whatever and and then hope for the best uh for a weekend trip because you don't want to have to pay for the extra thing but 
what's funny is now is that I like, for example, we didn't get a check back, but we did have a carry on. And so this was the first trip that Holly and I each had our own individual carry on bags because Holly found two very nice ones at Goodwill for eight dollars each. So I said, oh, cool. why not? Let's do it. And I still packed too light. I was telling Ben on the last day, I was like, dude, what the fuck? I, I packed way more underwear than I needed. I crapped my pants zero times and I still only have <laughs> one pair left for tomorrow. I was like perfect run where it was like I came home with no clean underwear, which to be fair, Houston was and I should have expected this way more humid than I expected. Oh, my God. Where it was horrifying. basically if, if you were out <laughs> for a little bit uh, for the day and you got back to your hotel and you wanted to go back out again, you wanted to change your clothes like immediately because you're so damp. Yeah, it's just, even, dude, I wasn't even damp. I was just dying out there. Like, <laughs> it's, as I said during the show, like my, my I, Lexapro, we think it's what's doing it. It's just making me overheat like crazy the last couple okay. of years. Okay. I, I used to be notorious for not sweating, for like like not sweating, for just being kind of like a just very comfortable person. And now Micah knows. I mean, I dropped the AC into this house. I, I sleep with a fan in my face, like literally a blizzard fan in my face, like inches away from it yeah. because I am so fucking hot all the time. And I was sweating on stage. I was sweating during the VIP event. I was sweating outside. I was sweating walking places i was sweating walking to the bathroom i was just sweating constantly <laughs> and it's just awful because i don't know what that's all about i kid around and right. say i'm getting fat and all that but it's i'm, I'm really not like it's I, so it's not like my this extra weight i'm carrying or whatever it's just these goddamn pharmaceuticals it's the meds yeah They're fucking me up you're They're fucking me up i can't believe it but yeah it's uh so yeah i was a little annoyed because i was like well i mean i guess i would have been way more annoyed have you ever done this where you didn't bring enough and then you realize you're like, mm, yes, I need to rewear something. So what do you do? You know, some people say you can turn the underwear inside out, <laughs> uh, which I've never I, I know that they're no. joking, but I'm even like, no, you can't. No, I, yeah. I, you could or you could wear your underwear in the shower uh, and try to like, you know, do like a little self. Oh, like, that's like, interesting. Yeah. Wash yourself I know a guy, and your clothes, you know, yeah. and then dry. No, them out. I know a guy that washes his clothes like that. He showers in his clothes. No, he soaps them up. At He's home? Good, I mean, yeah, that's a desperate he situation to to only. He just doesn't uh, want to go to the laundromat. I just wear I can't abide by that at that point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let me have a pair it fills a little bit of a column A and column B for you, as far as I understand. <laughs> so, yeah, it works for me. I'm looking um, forward to that. But yeah, for me, for me, it's like uh, I have actually a funny anecdote is that there's an E3 where I'm on stage with Shuhei Yoshida and Greg and Andrew Goldfarb at a theater and I have a jet shirt on and I look really underdressed for this. And people were like, why are you wearing a T-shirt and all this kind of stuff? It's because earlier that day, it was the last day I was in L.A. for E3 that year. Earlier that day, I had a red button down hanging up in my shower with the, the steam just going. Because, by the way, whenever I'm in a place where I'm not paying for the water, better believe I'm abusing the water situation. <laughs> yeah. so oh, to yeah. do certain oh, things, sure taking did. long showers, flushing the toilet as much as I want, whatever the case might be. And so I, but, the sh but the shirt fell into the shower no. and was soaking yeah. wet. And oh. I was like running. I was gonna be like, I gotta go. So I, I had I slept in the jet shirt and I just went and I was like, this is what I'm and <laughs> I sucks. and uh, that's basically what happened. So but typically I try to if I'm going to be gone for like four or five days, I just try to pack whatever I need plus one or two for everything. And then if it's going to be like two weeks or if I'm going overseas, it'll be all of that plus like, you know, twice as much extra. But still, I, I, and I wrote my notes because I didn't want to forget it. It's like I feel bad for women and stylish men. You know, all the shoes, the makeup, all the different things. And, and for me, it's like literally just T-shirts, button downs, jeans, underwear, socks. That's it. The thing that I was most afraid of forgetting were my pills because I'd fucking go cuckoo uh, sometime <laughs> when I was in Houston. And uh, that would have been a really interesting live show. And then <laughs> as far as checking bags is concerned, I never check bags, usually because in more recent years, I started flying first class where I wasn't having any problem getting overhead space. But our bag, obviously, way too big to fly with that. So we were checking it and I just hate the whole process of checking bags. I hate it. Why does it take so long? Why? Where? Why is this happening? Get the goddamn bag on the conveyor. I will say this, though, for the first time in what I think is was ever in my life. It never happened. We were first bag. Like right away, ready to go. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where That's Micah great. said, like, the, you know, it was like, Bing, and then, like, the, the conveyor started out. And then Micah was, like, pointed and was like, That's, that's the bag. And I'm like, What? Oh, you won. Because I, I didn't even, I usually don't even pay attention for the first five or 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. I'm just like, It's no, definitely yeah. not me. I know, I know well enough. It's like when we were on the TSA line and I, I immediately chose the wrong line. <laughs> saw the guy that was com- a guy complimented my Cobra shirt from like, you know, where we're winding. So he's behind me, you know, yeah. and then he's ahead of me suddenly. Oh, no. Because yeah, he chose no, the right line. That. You know, I never choose the right line, dude. <laughs> never. I never. Supermarket, quick, same thing. Quick anecdote. I don't know if anyone, Dustin, you're, you're too young yeah. to remember this probably. And Micah didn't remember it. But mm-hmm. Dig, I wonder if you do. Do you remember after 9-11, there was a time where you had to turn your laptop on? No, like you had to prove that it was actually a computer that worked. No, I don't this was recall. probably happening like, yeah, like right after 9-11. I remember that like where it was like you we've gotten to a point where we're much more comfortable and quick. But there was a time where it's like, oh, you have a laptop. Turn it on. That you know? was like, a wild. <laughs> that was a wild time. I yeah, told you was, about the time like this was like five days after because I was working in New York at the time. Somebody left. I, I was commuting from Long Island on the train to Manhattan, and that specific train had to stop in Jamaica, Queens, and transfer. So every day I would transfer to Jamaica. Well, somebody left their backpack on the train just by accident. Oh, man. And the conductor came outside the train and was like, somebody left their backpack, and everybody ran. <laughs> Everybody just ran as far away from this person. <laughs> Back when I was like, holy shit. This was like less than a week after 9-11. That was the culture. So I could see like, yes, the, the, yeah, people were flipping their lids with that kind of shit. So I could see them, TSA, really instituting all these. I'll tell you, we got our bag uh, checked on the way home for the first time and didn't even realize it until we got home. Oh, they like, called it yeah. from Houston, though. We bought bags of tea for her mom. And she and there was a you know a check bag and she was like they're gonna they're gonna search our bag, mark my words and never happened to us before. Came home, got the little letter inside. Your bag was gone through. It's the weirdest feeling. It's creepy. Yeah, it's just a little like, Fifth Amendment violation. No, it's shit. okay. It's a little Fifth Amendment violation. You got you got nothing to hide. <laughs> and you know what the you letter said? No big deal. I didn't realize this. The, if you had, usually we do have locks on our luggage. They would. The letter said if there were locks on here, we would have broken them off. That's why I told Micah, is that is that like that's what they typically do? Unless you have the ones that have like the master key or whatever, but they'll they'll break your shit. You know? They just snip it. They got the um, wire cutters that just break it right off. I'm less angry about the TSA these days because it's just much more efficient. And if it makes everyone comfortable, that's fine. But as I was, and you can read about this for yourself. Just go Google it. There are they the TSA fails all the time on a constant basis people get things through the tsa and report i got a knife like, through on accident once dude oh I, my god i didn't <laughs> mean to i did not this, mean to i'll say this straight up i mean i i wasn't me i don't give a fuck anyway but it was 18 years ago so i doubt the guys i doubt that guy's gonna get in trouble anymore my friend gus brought an entire ounce of weed through through security and logan on our way down to new orleans to c311 we smoked the whole thing down there and <laughs> no one Damn. was any of the wiser and it was like not even hidden i think he had it in a fucking sock Wow. So can I you just, answer like what will they do? Like let's say they caught this weed. Right. And you and you were will will they arrest you at your destination? I don't know. I think if they caught you when you were there with it. Well, your bag's traveling at the same rate you are, hopefully. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think no, I oh if it's if you're checking it, I see. It was on his person, right. I should say. Oh, it was on his person, okay. Which makes okay. it even better. So it got through okay, um, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, it was just on in his backpack. I couldn't even believe it. Like I and when you're 18 or 19, 20 years old, I don't think you care about anything. Like it's just, it's just a very <laughs> strange thing. But he did it, and thank God. I mean, we were, that was a wonderful show. 311 Day 2004 is a, is a legendary show, legendary uh, amongst 311 fans. But yeah, so people get things through. So I don't feel, I, I don't feel particularly safe. And I, hate, <laughs> I don't even want to articulate this, but I was telling my, Micah, I was like, here are some ideas about horrible things that terrorists could do that have nothing to do with an airplane. It's like, wh- why are they even focusing on these things anymore? You know, like I, to me, it's almost like 9-11 was the only thing that's going to ever happen like that because mm-hmm. no one's going to let their t- plane get taken over again. No one, you know, people forget when your plane used to get hijacked, they used to land it and trade you off. 9-11 was the thing about starting like to, to the, that that was going to change when people knew that that was no longer the case. Then they're not going to let their plane get taken over anymore. You know, so. I don't know. To me, I feel like we're worrying maybe about the wrong thing. I see a lot of different openings where I'm like, I'm so, I'm authentically surprised and very grateful that it seems like maybe our enemies are not that smart, you know, um, or not that sophisticated or not that able because um, 
we're so concentrated in this one place, not even doing a very really effective job of it, but everyone feels kind of comfortable. You're going through very sophisticated machines. You're yeah. doing this. Oh, I feel yeah, like I'm in a Seinfeld. I feel yeah. like I'm in a Seinfeld. Uh, <laughs> like I'm telling you for the last time or something like that. The Tide commercial. If there's blood on your laundry, maybe or no, if there's blood on your clothes, maybe laundry isn't your biggest problem. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Anything yeah. else to say about packing before we move on? The, I, the last thing I want to say is I always bring too much too much food. I always I always mm. anticipate bringing extra snacks because like Holly, I'm also, you know, like lactose intolerant. I always have a mild concern of like, oh, I, I should make sure I have some protein bars or something. And it's like I put like I, I a lot way too much space in my like purse for those when I could have thrown in like a book or something. I'm like, I got to have these protein bars. I ate one the entire weekend, <laughs> you know, because there was plenty of food that I could eat and it wasn't a problem. But I was just like, damn it, I could have brought, you know, I could have brought another book. And instead I was like, I have to allot all this space for protein bars. But then Colin didn't bring any snacks. And then he spent seven dollars on a bag of Haribo gummy bears. So in that yeah, scenario, yeah, poor price. I felt Ooh. like I was I glad I brought the snacks. I think I'm just like, I'm so used to that. It's just like <laughs> this is the cost of doing business in the airport. It just, unfortunately, it's just the way it is. You just don't do it though. You never give them the money. No. I would never buy it. I just wouldn't do it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that I was. I was literally inoculated from it for years because I would have the IGN Amex and I would buy whatever the fuck I wanted and then we would expense it and we had a per diem of whatever it was and we would never met it and it was fine. And I think eventually you just get that in your head and you're like, yeah, so now I'm using my own company credit card, which is just me. It's my company. (laughs) But still, there seems to be like a level of separation for it. But you're totally right. I I should be better about that. I always like to buy my big bottle of water and and uh Sometimes I like, to, you know, Houston Airport's pretty cool. I've never been to that airport. It's just huge. There's a lot of options, and they had Witch Witch, which I love. I oh, love. Oh, I didn't see that. I used to eat that in California all the time. So yeah, I was happy to see that. So there's a lot of different options there, which I appreciated. It was a nice airport. Yeah, yeah, um, it really was. And uh, just a quick postscript, like shout out to having just a good backpack. Like I have a pretty. I just got it on Amazon a few years ago. Just like kind of, you know, it was n- nothing too expensive, but it's just. Fits the laptop perfectly. Fits all my accoutrements nicely. I feel like a GI Joe actually because there's. I didn't do it this time, but there's a wire inside of it where you can plug in a battery inside, and then the wire from outside the bag connects to your phone or whatever. So it looks like you're, you know, like Techno Viper or something like that with all the shit sticking out on you. They, <laughs> they made that just about. for you. Dude. Yeah, definitely. I was like, oh, I love this shit. So um, yeah, so shout out to just having all those. And again, uh, we had a pretty decent experience. Our our. Uh, our voyage back was delayed like a half an hour or 45 minutes, but United, I've never flown United really very much domestically. I've, I've flown United a shit ton overseas and they have a horrible reputation, like in, in a lot Do of they? corners. Yeah. yeah like oh, in a I lot of, like that. a lot of people hate United. Okay. Um, now they don't have like the reputation of like the really bad, you know, like Ryan air or something like that. But a lot of people, United doesn't have a great reputation. I've heard domestically, especially. And um, I thought it was fine. You know, I it thought was, it was fine too. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah, fine. We we came down pretty hard in Richmond. I'll say that. Um, oh, a bad landing. Yeah. yeah, it was. I was trying to tell Mike. I'm like, that was a bad landing, but I've had way worse than that. If it makes you feel any better. So was that it was a horrible. crooked landing? No, 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 it wasn't. It was like a boom, like coming down Ooh. way too hard where like your, yeah. your wheels flex, you know, because yeah, we were no, coming out of the clouds announced. like we came, we obviously came in too hot, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They made an announcement saying we're going to land 15 minutes early because they want the airspace clear over DC. And so the guy was just literally like, instead of a nice leisurely landing, it's like, we got to get the fuck out of here and just like landed the fucking plane. <laughs> they got to get the UFOs and it out was, of there. It was just like, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was terrifying. I'm like, please don't. And then we're just like hit the ground and like, Ooh. I mean, the guy next to me was like asleep. He wasn't expecting. And he's like, raw, like jostling <laughs> around. It was like, <laughs> that's no which, fun. Uh, no, the kids behind us are like, or, we, like they're loving it, but I'm like, we could seats. die. Thanks, guys. Oh, yeah, no, that sucked. It, that yeah, that flight was, home was pretty horrible. I didn't have headphones, <laughs> so that oh, was rough. No. It was uh, Ooh, that's it was only two hours, so it's hard to get mad on that. You know, if that was a 16-hour flight, I would have set the rules real early. Been like, excuse me, mom and dad, 
<laughs> You're gonna have to. I'm gonna need you to keep a close eye on this, please. But it wasn't. You yeah, know, or, two hours. Like who cares? Two hours. Now. The guy next to me, like sniffing the whole flight. Yeah, I'd be like, you got to. And I was those, just dude. like, I don't have headphones. I I got nothing here. I just have to listen to this <laughs> oh, while there's some kids kicking my seat. <laughs> vegetable lasagna. Just looking at the center of the seat. <laughs> yeah, vegetable lasagna. <laughs> yeah, a little Seinfeld reference for those of you out there. Nice. Okay. Um. All right. I think I'll go next. So we've we've packed and now we've flown in and we've arrived and i wanted to talk about hotels versus airbnbs specifically because i found myself vacillating on this or have vacillated on it so much i'm way back just totally in the hotel camp but mike and i were talking the night we got back and we were just kind of reminiscing about the trip and talking about airbnbs and i was saying there was a time i mean i remember very well because i used to travel constantly and even ign and um, kind of funny would put us up in a lot of Airbnbs instead of hotels, and it was kind of preferable. And then over time, it got bastardized, like all things do, by capitalism in some way, for better or for worse. And and people like got into this for the business of it, and kind of ruined Airbnbs and made them an obnoxious and almost memes. And I've gone back to just loving hotels. But what I was reflecting on to Micah was, we. I looked at Airbnbs as basically when they came around being like, hotels are done. And I don't know why I thought that. And I think I thought that because Uber came around a little bit before that and taxis were done. I mean, they're done. They're, it, the only way taxis exist in any city is if there's a law against keeping Ubers out of your city or limiting their ability to function like they do in New York City. So they can only have so many available at one time and stuff like that. Otherwise, Uber would put cab companies out of business like they've done all around the world. And that's just a company eating another company and the natural pain of capitalism. But Airbnb, it got all fucked up. And I was I was just kind of curious. And I mean, at least from my perspective, I'm sure some people still like it. I'm curious what your guys inter- impressions are of hotels versus Airbnbs, where you stand in this, what your experiences are. And if you find that it's getting like almost m- meme worthy I, I, and, and kind of concerning, I saw a thing, uh, just as an anecdote, during the Super Bowl in Arizona, I read a story where there was like a 41 like mega Airbnb owner in the area that owned like X amount of units said that there was like a 40 percent, 48 percent vacancy rate during the weekend of the Super Bowl for Airbnb. And that that's like horrible. I mean, it's just a, a bad sign of your market. And I just I wanted to throw it out there and see what you guys thought. And I thought that our experience at, the, at our hotel, wherever we stayed, was was pretty good. And I was. I have a lot to say about that too. And I'll explain what I was saying to Micah about hotels and how I feel, what I feel about the different echelons of them as well. But um, yeah, let's kick it over to you, Dustin first and, and hear your thoughts. I feel like I've had a wide range of range of experiences at both Airbnbs and hotels from really bad to really great, but you are right that it seems like the, the feeling around Airbnb is definitely starting to sour in some ways. And for me, like the the bad Airbnb experience that I've had, and they're not even bad. They're just like I got what I paid for, <laughs> where there are situations where it's like, OK, I'm flying to this event to try to network. Uh, I've got no money for a hotel, but I can afford this Airbnb. And I'm either staying in someone's house, which is always a, a weird thing when you're staying in a room in someone's house uh, or I, I, the the ones that I've had that have been not so great where it's like, oh, this your room, you're in like a hall and your room doesn't have its own private bathroom like that's like. But again, it's it wasn't even to the fault of uh, the Airbnb. It's just I got what I paid for. So in some ways that even might be a positive because I had the option of something which was better than nothing at all, where if I couldn't afford a, a hotel, then I wasn't going or I wasn't able to do that. So it was positive. And it was like when I was there, it wasn't that it was anything like horrible. It's like not someone didn't attack me or try to steal my stuff or whatever. It was just like dingy and and not great, you know, but I've had some really awesome experiences as well as well, in particular things that hotels just can't offer, particularly when I've traveled in large groups back in uh, the handsome phantom days for me, me and the boys will go, would go to either Boston or Los Angeles or Anaheim for different events. And staying in an Airbnb was so awesome because we basically had like our own house or, or like half of a house with a duplex where we could call our own for a few days. So you have your own kitchen, we had a living room and a, 
uh, dining room where we could work and stuff like that. And we wouldn't have to all be in one room for everything. So like we could have like, I'm trying to think in Boston. Usually I would end up uh, on trips sleeping in the same bed as my friend Brandon, because we would do that when we were in, you know, junior high, like when you're staying at a friend's house or whatever. So it didn't feel weird. So Ben, Brandon and I to this day, if we're on a trip where we usually end up sleeping in the same bed, Uh, but Ben would have his own room and then our our friend Phil would stay on the couch or whatever. And uh, I don't know. It was like it made it so much more fun. Like we get to live together for a week and eat pop tarts totally blazed out of our mind at one thirty in the morning and order pizza and stuff like just like we always joke and say that when we go on trips that it's uh, that we're getting going to get into some debauchery. Which is ironic because it's like that you would think that if we told people that it's like, what are you guys going to get like a prostitute or something? It's like, no, we're just going to eat shit and get really high. And uh, that's about it. That's like our version of debauchery. But I don't know. Hotels can have their own perks, too, in that. Well, in an ideal situation, if you need something, you can call and it's just like brought to you instantly. You need towels or if you need another soap or something we had a really bad experience in houston where we needed more towels because we ended up switching over to my parents room for the night that uh wasn't the like the extra night we switched over to my my parents room and so uh yeah we like called to get towels and they just never brought them and my dad went down and reminded them when we went to leave for dinner and then they never brought them and then my dad eventually was like listen can you get me the towels right now while i'm standing here and eventually they did. And they're like, oh, sorry. It's like, <laughs> and then they, they, my dad also wanted another pillow. And they're like, we don't have one right now. Like, then what's the, like, so well, there, yeah. yeah, you can run into some shit like that too. Good call. Well, this is what I was going to say. And this is what I was saying to, to Micah and my, all my experience. I've stayed in the whole, this is exactly how I described to her, the whole spectrum of hotels I've stayed in all mm. from the fucking shittiest hotel uh, ramon and i stayed in a hotel actually at our friend kevin's wedding that was so disgusting and grimy like this motel that we actually left and we're like asked for our money back like it was horrifying and i've stayed in motel sixes and all these kind of things all you know motor inns and all that and this is how i was categorizing it was like that's like the lowest end and then there's like your standard days in ramada whatever the hotel we were staying in, which is Spring Hill Suites, is yeah. what I would describe as a person with a little bit of money's idea of a nice hotel. That's how I that's how I described it. This is a this is like a middle class hotel, like very like if you came from nothing and never stayed in a hotel before, you'd probably think that was pretty dope. And it was totally serviceable and totally fine. Yeah, it was. It's yeah. got like a pretty cheap bar kind of got it's it's nice little lounge, but it's, you know, a little bit whatever. It's it's not quite there. You know, it's like, again, I would describe that as like a person with a little bit of money is like nice the idea of a nice hotel. Like many of the places in Vegas are like that. And then I think from there, there are two echelons above that. The The next echelon would be like what I would consider is the nice hotel. This is like the W, right? Uh, places like U.S. Grant in San Diego, like really good hotels with service where they're not going to forget your towels. They're going to call you sir and madam. They're going to hold doors open for you. Um, they're going to tell you everything you need to know, bring you anywhere you need to be, all of that stuff taken care of, like their customer service is above and beyond. And then I think that there are the truly nice hotels. And I would consider one of those like where I asked Micah to marry me at uh, the Jefferson in, in Virginia, which is like a, ho- a hotel so expensive that I don't know why anyone would stay there for more than a night unless like I, it's like five hundred dollars a night at the minimum, you know, and that to me is like, that's cool for a night or two. I would spend a little bit less than that to stay at a place in Vegas, but you get all of the accoutrements of staying in Vegas, including access to like the casino and the pool and all these different things. This is just like a place of opulence, right? Not even a place I really need to stay at all. I don't need that. Me, I like to kind of come in square. Like my preference is to stay at a place like the Cosmopolitan in Vegas or um, the Aria or Encore in Vegas or um u.s grand san diego is one of my favorite hotels places like that are like where it's nice where you're paying a few hundred dollars a night you're getting something nice secure comfortable you don't have to look under the mattress you know the old (laughs) trick of like looking under the mattress make sure there's no bed bugs and all that kind of shit like the places where you don't worry about that and that's kind of i don't know if you guys agree with that economic categorization but that's kind of how i would categorize them and so i i personally like living well below my means 
and I, that makes me comfortable and I'm, I'm I really don't require very much. So put me in a fucking days in for all I care. Just understand I don't want to pay very much for it. You know, if I'm right. going to pay, if I'm going to be forced in a situation where I'm in a cosmopolitan type situation, little C cosmopolitan cosmopolitan type situation where I'm paying two or three hundred dollars a night for a hotel, regardless of where I'm staying, I'm not staying at the spring little suites. I might as well just spend another hundred or two and just stay at a nicer hotel, you know, um, and just have that comfort. But to the to the Airbnb, and I don't know, you guys can disagree with that if you want to the Airbnb point, I, and we'll kick it over to Dagan next. I wanted to I wanted to just call out four four quick things like memorable Airbnbs. Once I stayed on Skid Row, we used to stay down on Skid Row in L.A. That's where IGN would put us up in like the shitty like loft apartments over there during E3. And I stayed in a place like a fashion designer's loft apartment, and she was just growing weed in it, which was hysterical. So there was just like oh. weed plants in it which was legal, but I just thought it was strange and a very memorable thing for me. Uh, just because I was like, this is so weird. Like, how do you know I'm not going to walk out with this? Um, <laughs> and then uh, Louisville, when I turned 30, we stayed in a house in suburban Louisville, and that was really cool. And I think that that really imbued the spirit of um, early Airbnb, as well as my time staying in Airbnbs in San Diego early on during Airbnb's tenure. And what I mean by that is, I used to stay a few times in this like little in this dude's like little apartment where it was like twenty five dollars a night and he would just like fuck off to his girlfriend's house. And like that was kind of the spirit of it. Right. Was like you're making a little bit of money. You're going to stay there anyway. Why not have this guy stay in your space and just take a little change off the top or the people in Louisville where they would only get like a couple customers a month. And when they did, they would just move their shit to like their uh, the the wife's mom's house and they would take the money and put it in a college fund for their kids. So there was like an intent mm. to it mm. when it became mm. more of like a business and that right. churn. So the last thing I would say is that the last time I stayed in an Airbnb was I think in 2018. In fact, right before I launched Sacred Symbols, um, my ex and I went to Palm Springs and it was not a great trip at all for many reasons. But uh, we stayed in an Airbnb there and it was it was like the one with like a binder in it. Where it's like, here's all the things you need to do here. You got to take out of the garden or do the oh, dishes wow. and do all this kind of stuff. And there's cameras like outside, like why? And you can't shut them off and like all that. And I'm like, fuck this shit. And that was that was even before I think things began to collapse for Airbnb in terms of how people felt about it. But I just wanted to throw those things out there. Dig, let's hear from you about how do you feel about hotels versus Airbnb? You know, your stay in Houston, however you want to pull it. Sure. Yeah, we had Airbnbs when I was younger. We call we call them youth hostels, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's literally how me and my friends saw the country and got to skateboard in the you know throughout the country in our college days. You know, it was like thirteen dollars to stay overnight at some place, usually led oddly by like a really frustrated British guy in his thirties who had to oversee this place, and then. You know, we would get up to all kinds of hijinks and tomfoolery, and sometimes it was their fault. Like I remember one place in D.C., they had a vending machine, a soda vending machine, dispensing Red Stripe. Now you get like twenty-two-year-old skateboarders, five twenty-two-year-old skateboarders staying overnight, and you're dispensing seventy-five cent cans of beer in the basement near your pool. I mean, it was just like, you asked for whatever happens here. Like kind of like you kind of brought this on yourself type thing, but I've never stayed at an Airbnb, not even once. And that could be, hmm. you know, genera genera generationally, I just missed it. But Helene and I stayed at one old school bed and breakfast one on one of our trips to the Caribbean and St. John. It was really cool though. It was like six distinctive separated hotel rooms on this, on, you know, on these grounds, really nice and a little restaurant and a little pool. So that was like as close as I've ever stayed to an Airbnb. It's always been more corporate hotels throughout my life, really throughout my adult life. And really for me, I feel like you call like a little bit with this, like give me the luxury, right? Of a hotel. I think part of that is just my comfort. I grew up in the seventies and eighties. That's what we had. And that's just what I know. But, you know, give me the view, give me the concierge, give me the amenities, give me the 24 hour front desk, you know, the elevator, the convenience, maybe a nice restaurant inside. Maybe you overlook the beach, you overlook a nice city view, that type of thing. I feel like when I travel, I don't want it to feel like home. You know what I mean? Give me a middle tier hotel and up. And it, listen, it doesn't have to be the Four Seasons. And it's re rarely been the Four Seasons with us. You know, it's something on the nicer end, an above average hotel. We stayed at a really nice um, Hyatt in Toronto, actually, that was gorgeous downtown. Really nice, 
right in the in the midst of tiff and everything like that that was a really nice stay that we've had recently that i you know a, a recent thing in recent memory that occurs to me but Toronto, as they would call it Toronto in, in some in some parts of ontario <laughs> yeah but you know what dude i understand the model of an airbnb i mean it makes travel and seeing the world much more affordable and i could understand it from the proprietors point of view too like the the owner you're capitalizing on your property and if somebody's going in to stay there it makes sense i mean i have a lot of questions about the model and i think about it my personality as a homeowner like i could never oh go yeah into that. Like, no way think about no hotels way. right they're built for the wear and tear you know they have that infrastructure where they could sort of buffer the repairs and the upkeep and they have the coffers to and the model to take care of that, right? But like you're dealing like with a person-on-person interaction. And also like with hotels, like let's say it could either be a boutique hotel or a chain, you know, they're standards. So it really, if you're staying at a hotel, a Hilton or a Sheraton, or like I saw like a lovely boutique hotel in Houston that looked gorgeous called the Laura that looked really beautiful. But there's going to be standards. Like it can't get that bad. They're they're responsible. You know what I mean? There's a corporate standard applied to every one of those locations, regardless of where they are. They're going to take care of you if you put up a little bit of a fuss, a little bit of a fight, you know, where I know you're paying much less typically for the Airbnb, but that seems like, I don't know, that just seems like the Wild West to me. It's It makes me a little nervous for the renter yeah. and the rentee. You yes. Know. Sometimes you are paying more. And I mean, that's the whole thing. And this is what I was saying was that the the corruption of it over time. And I don't mean that it was like people are corrupt, corrupted. I just mean the corruption of the model yeah. by naturally getting bigger and kind of being subsumed by the need for just constant capital meant that it was no longer people doing it on the side or saying like, I'm leaving for two weeks. So why don't you basically sublet my place while you're in New York City and pay my mortgage for that month or whatever? That sure. was kind of the idea. And then it became like, um, I told Micah is like our dad when he sold our house in Brookhaven on Long Island to move out towards the Hamptons and he built a new house out there. So we had to get rid of this house and it was purchased by a, a couple that intended to only use it as an Airbnb. I forgot about that. That's and right. And it's like, really? I mean, on Long Island? I mean, what the? I don't understand what what the point of that is, but it was just a sign to me that it's a bastardization of the idea because it wasn't that people were getting houses to do it. It's that they were using their own it's the same thing with uber yeah i guess you could buy a car and do it specifically use uber to do you know and make it like this like ouroboros but really it was meant to be done on the side you know not to be like a full-time job so when we talk about the capitalism or like the the market capitalistic kind of nature of it and is it working or people being paid a fair amount of money it's like it's all fucked up i think partially because it wasn't meant to be used like this you know, right. and so it evolved. Yeah, There's right. So everything's else. kind of exactly it's everything's balancing out. But I think Airbnb might be one of those things where it might be losing. And uh, I'm very interested to see that happen because I, I really thought hotels survived. Like a lot of things are not going to survive. Hotels are definitely going to survive. So, um, Micah, what do you think about this hotel versus Airbnb conversation? What do you want to add? Yeah. So uh, like Dagan, I've never stayed in Airbnb. Um and I've also, I'm trying to like recall in my head, I think I've only stayed in six or seven hotels in my life anyways, but I did, like I noticed things in terms of quality a bit better now since we had that that weekend at the Jefferson, which was the nicest hotel I'd ever been in. It was it was really like an Eloise at the Plaza situation of like, I couldn't, I did not belong here. It was fantastic and I loved it, but I was like, I've never been in a place so lovely. It was incredible. And then, you know, it, it doesn't raise my standards to an unattainable thing, but it made me recognize like at the hotel we stayed at, which was clean. That's my number one thing. The hotel just needs to be clean and orderly, mm -hmm. you know, friendly staff. But it was little things like the TV in the room was in a really stupid place. So like the, you, you had your bed <laughs> and the TV nuts. was far to the left. It really was. And, and it was I'm so like, dark. It. it was so dark. It was very Ew, dark. Like they had it all the way, like <laughs> the light all the way down. I couldn't figure out how to put it up. Yeah. And then uh, the shower, we all oh, lamented the about the horrible yeah. shower. The, there was water all over the floor. And like my, my funniest <laughs> moment of the weekend was 
Colin had taken his second shower of the day on one of these days. And he's like, man, there's this water getting everywhere. And I was like, maybe you should get out, you know, because it's been like 20 minutes. And it's like, yeah, maybe we should stop adding to the problem because I also would like to take a shower. Well, I had to like rig we something up. Towels. Yeah, I was rigging yeah, something no, up trying horrible. to stop it from working, doing that because I wasn't doing you anything had a towel wrong. on the inside. Yeah, I was like, I'm just <laughs> taking a shower. I'm just standing in the shower. That's all I'm doing. It. The door is cl- sh- shut. Yeah, I don't know what else yeah. you want from me. I, I made like a little no. wet barrier with a towel to try to stop it from seeping. Did Not you also good. have this thing happening to you? Yes, yeah, same thing. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, it was the same <laughs> thing. They got Both in my room this. and my parents. That's crazy, dude. Like they yeah, must. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what that's all about. That's fucking bizarre, dude. (laughs) They use like a a porous tile or something. You have have a fundamental problem (laughs) with your your setup here. Not all their rooms were like that, though. I so uh, one of the guys there at the event, John, he brought his PSVR rig in a wheel. And I was like, bro, I got to stop by. I got to try the wheel. I don't know anyone with a wheel. When am I going to try it? And when I was there, I, I, I was like, oh, this room's nice. It's way different than my peaked in normal shower in that room. So I don't know. He lucked out. Depends on the room. Yeah. 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 And and I certainly was not blaming Colin for the water on the floor. It was more the funniness of him recognizing like there's water everywhere. And it's like, right, let's let's cut this off. <laughs> then. Let, let's fault. stop adding. <laughs> but it is. Um, I, I am definitely the person who's always been um, between poverty and lower middle class. And so for me, like this hotel was decent, you know, and it makes me think of when we went to I had a family funeral in Buffalo last year and that hotel was like a shithole. It was clean, which is that's what matters. But we arrive and the toilet's not working. And all it was was that the chain was off the tank. So like we fixed it ourselves, my sister and I, because it's an easy fix. But I'm like, I shouldn't be doing this. I like (laughs) who cleaned this room didn't notice that the toilet doesn't flush. Right. It's just like right off the bat. I'm like, this is where I am. And the walls are paper thin. So you could just hear all your neighbors and everything. Yeah, and, yeah. and 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 like at this hotel, we needed to call the front desk for something. It's we wanted to um check out like an hour later. And we call the front desk, it's like midnight, and like nobody answers. We try again later. The woman puts us on hold. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? That you can't just have this quick conversation. She didn't come back from putting us on hold. So then we hang up. Then she calls us back like 15 minutes later. And I'm just like, what? Yeah, like, what is going cool on? What were you doing? Yeah. It's- so the level of service is what I noticed. Mm, like having yeah. stayed that one nice time at the Jefferson, you know, everyone was friendly. That's what mattered. But I was like, this is not, this is not it. This is not what I expect. Like if I call the front desk, like, please answer the phone <laughs> and please help me. <laughs> like put aside whatever task you're doing for a very quick conversation where all I'm going to say is I'd like to check out one hour late. All, please. Also, you know? well, that was the other thing that I thought was funny about that was because I've called for late checkout a hundred times in my life. I've never had anyone ask, oh, what do you want? In my entire oh. life. <laughs> like, cause, like you asked me, that, you, you were like saying to them. Like that what we wanted that. And then they asked you like, oh, what time do you want? And I was like, right. that's yeah. not the way I, I didn't even know how to answer that. I'm like, I, I didn't know like, like how far, in my mind I was doing the calculus. Like, how far can I push this? Right. So I said one o'clock because I've never been accustomed to leaving anywhere remotely after that at, at a hotel. But I no. wanted to really push like two or three. I'm like, how far are you going to let me push this? Because you're asking, why are you making it open ended? Usually it's like, OK, we can do an hour. Or we can, a lot of times it's no. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times it's no and an, or an hour. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That was and nice. maybe that's what happened where we couldn't get our rooms that first day. Maybe everyone was like, I want to check out at four. Right. Please. That was the other <laughs> thing I wanted to complain about was this, <laughs> about this place and why I think this place is like not wasn't it was nice, but it wasn't that nice. This is an example. We are we are a, a group that has put together. What, what do we, how many rooms do we have? Like five or something mm-hmm. like that? Six rooms More than that. in a group. Yeah. And you don't have any of our rooms ready to go until well after even we're really supposed to be checked in. Like for me, the a level no, of, it was, they had them ready by the actual time they said they would. Right. But, the, we but were asking to me, before. it's like we arrive and let them know we're there at nine in the morning. I know that's egregiously early to be there. And they had no vacancies apparently because I asked them, I'm like, can I just rent a room like now? I just want to go to bed. And they were like, no. So, but to me services, okay, we know we have this group here that have spent, that is spending thousands of dollars at the hotel. Let's make sure that the first room that comes up, you know, that's clean. We get one of them in there or whatever. That's that's the whole point I'm talking about. It's like you had right. nothing for us yeah, that for sense. that. We were sitting there for hours and hours. It's like that's that would that actually kind of grinded me my gears a little bit. I'm like, that's bullshit, dude. I, I know a lot of people in hospitality and 
I know that like you could have gotten one a room or two for us. I know that that like could have happened. And why you chose not to do that is your choice, and that's fine. But a place like the Jefferson wouldn't have let someone that had six rooms be there and be like, okay, you can sit in the lobby for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> that would have never happened. Yeah, they would have found a way, right? right yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah, is yeah. the difference. But it's cool. It was totally clean. It was totally fine. The people were very friendly. I think the people in Houston largely were very friendly. The air, the uh, the Uber drivers, people in restaurants, the bartender we had at um, what was that Truth Barbecue? Truth uh, Barbecue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was really really nice and helpful. Like pe- you know, concierges were nice. Bartender. Yeah. It was re- yeah. It was all good. All good. Uh, I for, thought of something I yeah. wanted to share about Please. hotels. That is, I can't believe I didn't think of this earlier. I can't remember when I was, what what trip I was on, uh, but I was with my parents and I think Holly was there too. And we rented a room and we went, uh, we went to check in. We went, we checked in or whatever. We got the keys and we all got our bags and I scanned the door and I opened the door and there's just a family straight up eating lunch (laughs) sitting there. (laughs) What? And we look like there's like the it was like a cartoonish moment where like I look at them, they look back at me, and I look at them. I say, <laughs> "Hi," and they're like, "Hey," I said. I think there might be a problem. They're like, "Yeah, it kind of seems like it." And uh, so yeah, they totally gave us the keys to someone's room. Which here's the problem. There's I was trying to figure out like what what could it be? Was it that? I initially was like, oh, well, they didn't check out when they were supposed to. I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense because they were supposed to clean the fucking room. So it wasn't mm. that. Did they just someone give me the wrong room number, which is also a problem because how do you know they're not going to give away the keys to your room when you're gone? Stuff like that. And what's funny is when this happened, this wasn't the first time that it happened to Holly. Holly was on a family trip growing up where they went to a hotel and they went to go to their room and there was a dude showering when they no. went in. Which dude. They Holly's dad was like, yeah, we're get we're going somewhere else because That's this phenomenal. is ridiculous. But the fact this has happened twice, I mean, once with me and then once to her before, I'm like, I don't know. It makes you kind of suspicious about other instances, too, where it's like <laughs> in the know. age of computers, that should not you, happen. No, totally. Yep. That, that it shouldn't. There should be no issues with any of that. That's very, very strange. That's amazing. You're very trusting yeah. at a hotel. Mm-hmm. You're leaving all your stuff. You are sleeping somewhere and other people have a- the there are people that have access to everything, which I guess there is like the the deadbolt lock that you can put mm-hmm. on technically. But those aren't even that secure because they definitely have a way. Well, yeah, you have to be up. inside yeah. for those to be useful, you know, as well. Like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, true. Because well, yeah. I'm saying like you leave your hotel room just generally speaking anyone can just take anything they want like when i go overseas i i pretty much carry my passport with me all the time yeah. like i leave a bunch of shit in my hotel room all my valuables but i just take my passport i'm like i can't have this fucking scene where i gotta can't go to the goddamn it. embassy and i have to talk to these <laughs> fucking people and figure you know it's like god oh my, i know they deal with that shit every day where you have to go to the console and imagine being in the united states and that kind of shit happening from you you're from fucking the philippines and you're, and you're in kansas city and you have to go to wherever the console is for the Philippines, Washington or New York to get a new passport mm-hmm. and figure that all out. And you can't leave until you do that kind of shit. It's like, that's the stuff I was always afraid of losing. Um, but yeah. And, and I, I've had, Oh, you know, I had another good Airbnb experience in Iceland. I, mm-hmm. I got a nice apartment there in Reykjavik, which was pretty cool. That's but, cool. And you could like cook and stuff. And that was cool because the food there was like getting a little weird sometimes. So I was, I was going to the supermarket and making a little, also the Islanders were in the playoffs when I was there and so and everyone was really mad at me including my ex at that time was just like really put off because I'm like they were like going out I'm like the Islanders are on so I'm gonna (laughs) I'm gonna stay here and watch that um and I was like using a VPN and shit to like I can't believe they were surprised yeah I'm like I'm like I'm not missing an (laughs) eye like are you kidding me it was it was I was saying to um to uh to Micah that when we were uh what we were talking about with the Jets where we I almost I was gonna miss a Jets game and I was like that would have been totally unacceptable uh, the catering tasting. Oh, right. Was the catering like, tasting. If, if the Jets had ended up in the playoffs or something. Yeah, if the Jets were in the playoffs, then they you g- might have had to miss it. It would have interfered with the catering. And what she doesn't realize is that it would have interfered with the catering and I would have watched the it. It would not have. It would not but have. But they weren't in the playoffs. I wouldn't so don't worry live about here it. anymore. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No, we, we never have to worry about it, do we? Jeez, you're being mean to me today. All right. <laughs> Let him have it, my good. So it's normal. I don't like it. Listen, if we if Dustin has to deal with it and I have to deal with it, you have to deal with it. That's it. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the final topic. We throw it over to Dagan. So we're Dag, we're we've packed for the trip. We've 
stayed made our stay in the trip we've met people on the trip and now we do something else on the trip all right i want to talk to you guys about a great love of mine actually and that's discovering new cities and i want to know you guys thoughts on this so i i love traveling i love discovering new places but i'm a mark for the city right i i just i'm fast i've always been fascinated the urban environment you know the infrastructure i love taking in a new skyline just those mad made the you know the man made metropolis and the flavor of a new city i'm excited to do this overseas which i never really did i got to get i got to get going on this but just in the country i always loved it and you know a lot of that for me in my youth was you know um part of that story was skateboarding and everything like that but i just love seeing a new city and you know there's different perspectives on this because you could take the whole tourist trap Disney World approach, right? And you could go to Manhattan, you could go to Times Square. You could go to the essential, you know, family restaurants and the must-see landmarks and the sites and you know, all the to- you could take the touristy angle. But what Helene and I love to do and kind of been taking this tact ever since we've been married with various cities is let's go and get a locals angle on the city because just an over and this isn't a snobby thing at all. Like it was so cool to see downtown Houston and get a sense of the weather and the people and the culture and the cuisine and just get the lay of the land and maybe see where the art museums are and the the essential landmarks. But it's so, and you know, seeing the sites, that's one thing, but I love to go where the locals are at, you know, where the locals hanging, what are they eating? What do those neighborhoods look like? I love the neighborhood, you know, so like I'm thinking like the Brooklyn to Manhattan, you know, the Fishtown or the Maniunk to Philly, you know, name that, you know, sort of cool hip neighborhood to the major city. That's what we like to do. So we in Houston, we found the Heights, right? The Heights neighborhood, which was like reminded us of where we're from, like Doylestown, sort of artsy fartsy, local yokel type of flavor. And it was like a 25 minute car ride from downtown Houston. And we did it two, two mornings in a row and just went and eat, ate at a cool spot, you know, discover the cool coffee spot, um, the cool places, the mom and pop shops and all that kind of thing. And it was a cool looking place. A lot of really beautiful Victorian and craftsman style houses. And then the main street with all the local shops and everything like that. Really cool ice cream store named, what was it called? Sweet Bribery. I thought Ooh. that was the coolest name for an ice cream store ever. I yeah, was like, that cool. is the best name for an ice cream store. And, you know, just kind of like that fashionable, younger, hipper vibe. Maybe because we're aging, we're kind of clamoring to stay young. So that's a big part of it. And I like in that years ago, I thought of doing this where what I like to do in a city, get a little souvenir for myself and it makes me feel good. I try to find the core skate shop in each city, which oftentimes is in a neighborhood like this and just get a t-shirt, you know what I mean? Support local, support mom and pop, the one-off skate shop type thing. We did find the Supreme proxy, like the hype beast shop, which was called proper. And they were, they were just, they were throwing a bad vibe in there though. They weren't Mm. saying hi. There was no, there was no actual skateboards. There was just all the gear Mm. and then $55 t-shirts for a proper t-shirt. Come on, man. Like no. get, I'll, I'll do 35, but 55, come on, that's a bit much. And don't even say hi when we walk in. Come on. Know your own. You know what I mean? Type of thing. But everybody else was super cool. So those are the type of things we like to do. Going into a new city, I think just taking in new skylines is breathtaking. I love that. You yeah, know, I love too. comparing it to New York, comparing it to Philly, the things we know. And you know, we've been I've been doing this for a long time. You know, I got a chance to to see a lot of Pittsburgh because my friends went to college there. I got to see a lot of Boston because my friends went to college there. But there's a lot of cities where we just said, you know, let's go see New Orleans. Let's go see Charleston. Let's go see Atlanta. So we got to do that with Houston and it was really cool. So yeah, just give me, give me your thoughts on Houston. Give me your thoughts on seeing new cities, favorite cities, how you like to do it, favorite parts, whatever you want. Mm. Uh, Dustin, you go first. Yeah. Well, I think you're right, Dagan. I I love the perspective of trying to keep it local when you can. And the way I view this is just that it's like, um, when you can, if you can go something to it, is at least like 
at the very least a local chain, preferably even smaller than that, a local shop. That's that's what's awesome. And somewhere jumping between those things like Holly and I walked a decent, decent amount to try to find like any kind of coffee shop we could that was just wasn't Starbucks, which, of course, we ended up like sometimes you need that that convenient level as well. But sure, going going to and experiencing the city for what it is outside of the toy, the touristy stuff. And to be fair, like the touristy stuff, you you got to have that balance. Like for me, my first time in New York city, it's like, yeah, I want to see times square. I don't need to make a big thing of it, but it's like, I want to go and, and see it for a second, you know, just see what that's all about. But sure. You're right. It's about, uh, figuring like the walk of the walk, you know, how to walk the walk when you're there. And what was so exciting and so special about Houston when we were there is that it was during the time of this big rodeo, like the, some kind of Houston rodeo thing. And so the day after our event, there was a huge parade on the same block as our hotel. And I was like, yeah, let's go check out the parade. And it's funny because initially when we got there, I was, I thought, man, the, the thing about like people from Texas love being from Texas is true. Uh, from what I've seen, like a lot, a lot of cowboy hats, a lot of different stuff like that. And I'll, and then I think there is some of that authentically, but I think that it was also that this, we were there during a time where Houston was really celebrating being Houston, which was cool. You know, where we're watching the parade, there's guy like a bunch of uh, guys and that with horses and cowboy hats and stuff like that and all kinds of crazy stuff. It was really fun. So I love, I loved that angle of it, but I, Oh guys, I got to show you. Uh, we went to Bucky's. Here. Oh yeah. Oh, we went to Bucky's. Oh, there it is. The mascot. And that's one of those, Legendary. you know, one of those touristy, I, I guess it's a Southern thing. It's not just a, a Texas thing. Okay. We had to go to Bucky's, and that's what I'm saying. It's like people. I think a good comparison is when people from the West Coast shit on In and Out in front of people from the East Coast. They're like, it's not that good. You don't need to go there. It's <laughs> like, I just want to go experience it. I know you have it all the time, and maybe you don't like it, but also it's, it's great. Yeah, I just think yeah. people. I think people are. It's not the I best, it. but it's right. great. Right. I mean, it's that's great. Good. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't turn it down an In and Out burger ever. You dumb Absolutely. fucks. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you're just used to it they're right. just well, used to it out there. right and it's, it's, it's like it's certainly you know ketchup instead of spread let's be serious oh uh, uh, whoa animal so style, maybe go on animal style uh, so yeah so it's about i don't know seeing seeing these types of things and totally checking it out i will say though it can be a bit stressful for me uh because and, and i think that maybe the audience has picked up on this is that Sometimes I think that my uh, analyzing and trying to be the most optimal about things can can ruin my own experience where I'm thinking about it's like, OK, we only got this much time today and I want to make sure I do the thing I want to do the most. And I also want to try or the things I want to do. And I'm also trying to figure out a way that I don't waste a million dollars in Uber. So we got to figure out how to line these things up and stuff like that. And so, like, like I said, I think sometimes that can come off to people that I'm, I'm being cheap about it. And it's like, no, I, I just I can't help but think about like the cost and the time analysis of everything. Like that was the thing for us with Bucky's is that me, my parents, Holly and Ben and Emily, we all wanted to go and we had to go to the big one because there's no point in going to the small one. No. And I so agree. it's like a 35 minute drive in Uber XL. So it's like, yeah, it's going to be fifty dollars there and back uh or fifty dollars there and then fifty dollars back is there anything else we can do out there and stuff like that it's like you know what fuck it we're here it was a big thing in the show where we talked about bucky's we gotta go we just gotta do it possibly the biggest thing in the show <laughs> yeah oh yeah and it was great holly well I, and and i wasn't joking and for you know the people that weren't at the show i was saying that holly was really excited to go there like she was really amped and it's not that it was amazing it is a like Walmart sheets hybrid, not Walmart, but it's, I don't know. It's a really big glorified gas station. If you have the expectations, how was the food? It's cool, dude. I got a sliced brisket sandwich. Yeah. Oh, that was awesome. Just like sliced brisket and barbecue sauce on a sandwich. That's it. Hmm. It was amazing. How were the bathrooms? So the bathrooms, yeah, the bathrooms are fine. Uh, you know, they were clean. And OK, the one thing that did stick out to me, Micah, you 
won't, you won't, won't. I'll explain for Micah, but the boys will know. <laughs> I find it when you go into a bathroom and you're looking at the urinals, if there's no divider, it's barbaric. You need a bar, <laughs> oh, a, 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 some kind of barrier. You don't want someone checking out your, your big hog? <laughs> I mean, I'd rather not. No, I just need a little space to myself when I'm taking a wee, you know, just yeah. give me a little bit. And I can't it, honestly, if there's no divider, there's a high chance I'm going in a stall, you know, and it's not that not a high chance. If, if it's busy, I'll do it. I can't stand the trough at the sporting oh, arenas. No. Yeah, the trough is disgusting on multiple levels. I like the so trough anyway, for efficiency, to be perfectly honest with you. But yeah, go on. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. It feels so, like prison to me, the trough. I don't know. For Bucky's. <laughs> <laughs> for for Bucky's, the the divider is literally from ceiling to floor. Oh, it's, wow. and it's literally like a foot and a half wall. So it is the ultimate divider Very between cool. urinals. You could like rest. Right? You could like have a little re- like make a little safe room. You move oh, in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was great. So, you know, that was that was nice. So to round this all up, though, I'm just I uh, you got to check out the local spots. My dad in particular is obsessed with going to breweries to the point where it can be. I don't want to say annoying, but as soon as we were done eating at Truth Barbecue, which was amazing, by the way, that's one of those spots. That really? Like, was. Oh, nice. You're not going to get stuff like this anywhere else. Yeah, I was, so, I, I, I was um, surprised that they made legit cocktails and yes. had barbecue. I've never had that before. And I thought the Very brisket cool. was ex- excellent. No burnt ends. I didn't have burnt ends. But mm. uh, yeah, I loved the brisket. Very good. Yeah. So, yeah, as soon as we were done eating there, which I, I felt like I couldn't even move. They you need to pick up, get a, like a semi to like get us out of there because we were so like we ate so much food. My dad's like, oh, there's a brewery. You can stop by over there. I'm like, no, you can't. But we did go to some <laughs> awesome breweries to check out the local beers. Beer and coffee is actually one of the main things for me that it's like. Let's do it. If you're walking somewhere, you see some coffee, just get some grab a beer real quick, whatever. It's all about that because that's that's the type of thing that you really can't get uh, when you're at home. Usually, Micah, talk to me about about well, well take I guess a pull as usual, whatever thread you'd like. Well, I have one question for Dustin. Did you try yes. the hotel coffee? They have those like cartridge based oh, Keurig style machines. Did you try it? No. So okay, you're referring to the in room coffee. Yes. Uh, yes. I have tr- I've been too desperate too many times to do that. And I was not in a desperate situation <laughs> on this trip. I will say I did have to have the the uh, like the breakfast coffee that they have when people go to breakfast. And it was horrible. It was oh, so really that it was sucks. so bad. And it sucked because the only reason I got it was because the Starbucks, because the ho- the uh, parade there was like. 30 people in this tiny Starbucks, which I don't even like Starbucks. So I was already compromising. <laughs> I was like, well, I, I need, I got to have this caffeine. And so I had to cut it with a uh, cream, which is <laughs> not like me. I didn't oh. feel myself. Oh, well, well. I, I had to ask that. Um, I'm the worst person about exploring new places. And it's probably because I'm a creature of habit. Like I'll say, when I first came to visit Colin, it was October uh, 2020, and I land in Richmond. I had a couple hours to kill. The first place I went was Subway. And I'm driving by Waffle House. I'm driving by places I've never seen before, all these new restaurants. And I'm like, I just want some Subway, though. Just give me a little taste of home. Mm. They did have like a regional ginger ale that I had never had before. Ooh. So that felt like new enough. Sure. But it... it it made me think when Dustin was talking about um, going new places and trying to avoid some of the chains. But sometimes it is fun, like you said, with in and out to try like the regional chains. Right. Like if you were going up to Massachusetts, I'd be like, you got to go friendlies. And once I've upon a been. time, I would have yeah. said, you got to go the ground round. They don't oh. exist anymore. <laughs> That's so sad. But it, yeah. But, you know, friendlies would be a staple. I'd be like, you have to go here or uh, Papa Gino's. Which is like oh, a chain man. pizza place. I haven't heard of Papa Papa John's. in so long, dude. I haven't even oh, thought of that. So good. Wow. It's so good. What about D'Angelo's? There's a couple. I love D'Angelo's. I was never a fan. I like Subway. Yeah, I love D'Angelo's. That was that's. I think they still exist. Uh, they do. They do. There's one in my hometown yeah. that you can you can oh, go I to if we that visit. Place. I love that place. But I am. I I'm definitely more of I guess like a touristy type person. Um, and being in Houston though was interesting because I haven't done much traveling as an adult. 
And I realized that some of my timidness about like going places is my mom is from the big city and I'm not, I've never been like a city person, but she used, whenever we'd go places, she'd be like, don't look like a tourist. So it would be like, don't look at the tall buildings, pretend you belong here, pretend that you have no awe or wonder at anything. Oh, that's so sad. You know, since I was a kid, I realized my mom is like part of what ruined travel for me, like no offense to her, but it's like, I finally kind of let some of that go on this trip to Houston, like at the airport, there was this really cool like bar that had these wine bottles, like going way up high on this like structure. And I'm like, look at that, you know? And for a split second, I was like, don't be a tourist. And I'm like, who, who cares? Right. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah, I don't care. Marvel I don't care. At thing. Exactly. So I'm trying to let that go because no, I don't want to be like the tourist with like the camera around their neck and like the knee high socks, but like <laughs> a selfie stick. I want to actually experience things and, and be able to feel like, yeah, I can look at this and be like, wow, that's really cool without feeling lame for yeah. it. And Houston was a taste of that. We had some really great food at all these places. We went to this awesome breakfast place, the Breakfast Club. That was just phenomenal. Everyone was super nice there. And that was, you know, a taste of like something really local, you know, felt like a hidden gem that was there. Um, but I do, I kind of wish that I had explored a bit more. Some of it though, is that we were there for business, you know? Yeah. And I wasn't trying to overwhelm Colin with like a list of things I want to see. Cause really my role on these trips, I mean, a big part is just support. And it's like, no, you know, you guys are the ones that are actually in the production type thing. So I don't want to give you an itinerary that's going to tire you out. And then we have to the next day have this big show. So it's more of like, I'm going along with things, you know, let Colin take the lead on what we want to plan because I'm not trying to stress him out with, I want to see these 10 things and we only have a couple hours to do so. But it, it does inspire me that I, I think I would like to travel a little bit more than I maybe have ever wanted to. I'm, I'm not much of a, a jet setter. I hate flying because it's very scary, but I'll do it. But my approach, yeah, I think is going to change after this trip oh, to Houston and like thinking about planning our honeymoon, for example, and actually really diving in and instead of just getting there and then saying, well, now what? Like actually <laughs> planning things out. Well, it's, fu it's funny you should say that because I was, I was thinking about mentioning to you, like we should hire someone to like do all that, you know, like. Right. Yeah. I actually was looking online at travel agencies. I don't want to do these eight hour tours oh, no, of the no, no, city, no, no, no. but I do want to have an idea of, it'd be great to have someone tell me, Hey, here's five restaurants near your hotel. Right. Here's a couple museums that you should go see. It's just someone to give me a list of ideas that are just things that I maybe wouldn't even think of because yeah, I could have done more exploring in Houston, maybe even by myself, but it, it would have been better if I planned it a bit more speaking to someone before the trip. And they were like, well, why don't you look, you know, before you go, go online, look at restaurants. I'm like, no, but a big part of that was I was so nervous about the trip. I didn't want to think about it. Yeah. And so I didn't want to make it more real by Googling these places that I could theoretically go, you know. But I, I think a big thing for me on this trip was discovering that maybe I like travel a bit more than I thought I did. And maybe I shouldn't just go to Subway Every time I go somewhere new, you know, we tried Witch Witch instead. There was a subway at the airport that we passed by, but I said, no, we'll try the other sandwich place. So it's, it's important for me. I'm, I'm growing as a person. I'm ripening. That's beautiful. Oh, gross. <laughs> That's beautiful. I don't and like you're balancing the that. comforts with the adventure. Like it's okay to have a little bit of both, you know, and think about how nice like your honeymoon's going to be or not like having more time. Like the LSM trips are fun. But they're so short. They're so abbreviated. Like we have a job to do. We're in and out. You know, when you could travel and really enjoy, then I think you'll you'll enjoy yourself. Dig in. Yeah, absolutely. I'm disappointed. Uh, so after the the show, we all wanted to go out somewhere. And my mm. dad was trying to find places. He's like, well, there's this heavy metal bar called the Dirt Bar. We were like, you know what? Why not? Let's go. And then we got there and we got out. The music was loud outside. It was. We were like. We cannot even, we won't be able to talk to each other <laughs> at all. But now I'm thinking, I kind of wish I could have gone back because I'm kind of curious about this heavy metal bar, the dirt bar, like what that was like in there. It looks but cool. The, the other place we went was pretty cool, like had really great drinks, which it was did. right next door. It, it really did. Yeah. No seating <laughs> that we could find though. It yeah, was all taken. It's, it was unfortunate. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, for me, I think I, I don't think this will surprise anyone. I I think because I did most of my traveling for work, I was very accustomed to having a series of tasks to do. Often you'd get there, you'd have like dinners and you'd have like a prearranged itinerary often, or you just have a little bit of time where you go and fuck off for a day or two and get your work done and go eat where you want and stuff like that. And I would do that, but I'm just not much of a, I'm not really very curious to be honest about like a lot of these places. I, I like, I, I like it's very much the checkbox Colin, like where I like being having said that I've been places more than I care that I've seen anything in them where it's like, yeah, I've been to Europe. Yeah. I've been to Japan. Yeah. I've been to all these places, but like, I don't care about the specific things that I really saw there as much as just having those check marks, like accomplished in some way. Okay. And Take the box. Sure. Yeah. Like, so it's like, yeah, super potato was an awesome experience. I love going there into family and all these other legendary video game stores. And those are like the very, I guess like in Tokyo, when I would go there, it's like going to Akihabara would be about as close as it would be to me, to having something important to me. And that's literally an afternoon at the most you'd take the train to the Akihabara stop. You get out. There's like three or four of these like legendary stories. You go check them out you leave. And that's, that's like what I would do. And then I would go back to the hotel and make content and do whatever it is and watch TV and hang out. I don't know. I just, and I, I would also find places that I really liked in places I would go again. So like Tokyo and in Germany, and then I'd be very comfortable eating there. And then I would, so I, there's this ramen place, like this off the beaten path ramen place. I knew, I don't know why I liked it. It was like 10 blocks away from my hotel and I would just eat there constantly just because I knew it was good. And I think a lot of that is just this, this, um, this resistance towards having a bad experience. Like I don't like going to new restaurants. I like going to restaurants that I know are good. Yeah. That's like people are like, oh, I I like trying new foods. I'm like, I only like trying new foods to the extent that I find new things to add to the repertoire. Other because when I go to a restaurant, like I used to get really mad if I'd go to a restaurant in L.A. or San Francisco and it's like we're going to a new place. Like I could have just gone to Nopa. I could have just gone to Wayfair Tavern. I could have just gone to all these different places that I know are fucking awesome. Instead, I wasted this opportunity, this money, this time, this uh, this instance on going to this bullshit. And it's like it reinforces in my mind. No, that's why you that's why you go to Hogshead. That's why you go to all these different things. You know? Yeah. Um, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Right. Exactly. That's, that's exactly thing. the way I am. So it's funny to me, yeah. like for how long I lived in San Francisco, I saw that city really intimately. But there were parts of the city like North Beach and the marina and other places where I I very rarely went until I had to because I was so comfortable in my own space in the hate in the sunset in the Richmond um you know all the Knob Creek and all or not Knob, uh not Knob Creek Knob Hill and all the different things places that I like to be and with a city that small 7 miles by 7 miles you can only imagine it's like in New York City I barely I barely seen any of New York City really I mean I, I would go there because when I go into Manhattan I would go play chess at the same place and then I go eat at the same place and I'd go to the same bar and then I'd go to the same fucking train station and then I'd leave. And I think that's kind of how I absorb things so that when I was in Reykjavik, it's a beautiful place. Iceland was beautiful. I was just I'm like, why am I still here after? And I didn't mean it to be a dick. It's like I've been here for two days. I'm ready to go, dude. I'm, I saw I'm, it. Like, I'm, go- go? I'm good. <laughs> like, I'm totally good. It's like an excruciatingly long time that we're staying here. And so I'm just not much of a natural traveler, but I do have an inclination towards seeing places and I'm open minded to going and seeing places. And I've done a lot of it. And I do think that a lot of it was programming, like um, like Micah said that she was programmed perhaps by her mom to to be like to not be so much of a tourist. I think I've just programmed by my experiences to just be very efficient and just be like, I'm just here to do something. And I'm not really I'm not really here to, to to see or do much of anything. I'm just kind of here. And that's kind of the way and I just like being in my own space. I'm not, the honest answer is that there are places around the world that I'm very curious about and would love to see with my own two eyes. But I've reiterated many times, if I never left the U.S. again, that would be fine. Like, I'd be perfectly fine with that. I wouldn't shed a single tear about that. So it's it's uh, it's no offense to the rest of the world. It's just I'm very comfortable here. I imagine a lot of people feel that way where they're from, too. And my idea of like vacation or free time is just not doing anything in my own space. Yeah. That's yeah, that's yeah, vacation, yeah. not me being halfway around the world in a hotel room wishing I was in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and travel could be stressful, too. You know, sometimes it's not parts of it are not fun, you know, just by their very right. nature. You got to get a place. I hate it. Yeah. The cooler yeah. the place, the further away it is. And so 
it's you want to go to Europe. It's not going to be so bad from the East Coast. It was horrible from California. You want to go to Japan. Mm. It's going to be a fucking task to get there from Washington, D.C., man. Settle in is all I have to say yeah, to you. That's a long you know? flight. Um, I, I, I think I'm kind of like don't want to. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like that's why because we had the idea for our honeymoon of going or I did anyway. I, I pitched it and we're not locked in anything. But I was like, we, we should just go to Australia, maybe New Zealand, Australia, and then just fly up to South Korea and Japan and come back. That's you know, lovely. If we're yeah, going to be on that. that side of the world, sure. Might as well. I mean, it's still a very long flight from Sydney to Tokyo, but it's not nearly going to be as long from Washington to Tokyo. So since we're all the way yeah. over here, it's like, well, just do that and then just fly back. But it's a commitment, man. It's like, because that's what I was saying. I'm not worried about getting home or from, it's like you can fly from Sydney to anywhere in the world. Like it's not, you could fly from Tokyo to anywhere in the world. It's just that when you commit to leaving, it's going to take you an entire day of your life to get back. You're right. going to be so fucking disoriented by the time you get back. You have no idea. That's what I used to love when I'd fly from Tokyo to San Francisco, specifically Tokyo to San Francisco. You'd get back before you left. <laughs> That's oh. so strange. <laughs> like you, you, would, you actually literally would get back before you left. Wow. So, so like we would leave. I remember we would leave like Sunday afternoons when I, the, the two times I was there. And then so we would fly and we would get back right before football started because I would. That's like why I pl- I, tr- I plan those flights. And I'd get into my Uber and I'd get home and the Jets game would just be starting. So like we were just we were like missing two hours somewhere. So I just it, it's a lot. Some people really live for it. But I also know that if I do this, I'm flying first class. I, I've never oh, flown sure. anything, anything but coach ever in my life. International domestically, I've flown first class. Not a big deal. But international, I've been in the fucking cattle car, dude, every time. And I'm not doing it again. Like no, that is I wouldn't do that, that is 100 percent like not happening again. So. <laughs> <laughs> so like that's a one that's like one big ask is that i'm not because d- these i don't think people i didn't even fathom how big the international flights were until you're really on them i mean you're talking about five six five probably something like that across as, sure. as opposed to three and three on a domestic flight that's huge i mean that's a lot and then it's just way deeper and i remember really uh, being in awe the first time I went international, people getting off the plane because it actually happens way quicker on international oh, flights, really? in my opinion. Yeah, because there are two, there are a little bit wider lanes and two of them usually. So oh, people are eyes. getting off and like just going twice as fast, in my opinion. Mm, that and, makes uh, sense. And, and so there's just like a whole different vibe to it. You get off in the middle of the plane and I don't know, it's just, it's just so strange. Some people go left when they get on the plane. Some people go right. I want to go left. And I've never gone left. You know? <laughs> So that's if we do do that, and I think we will, that's the way we're flying. And it's going to cost a lot of money, but that's money well spent because I can't because otherwise it's what Micah said. I'm going to dread just waiting for this to happen. Just like I've been and 16 hour flights, 14 hour flights. I've done it. It's bad. That's a lot. It's really bad. I mean, I was losing it. You know, like, oh, my God. So anyway, um. So I'm not much of a city explorer, really. I mean, I've naturally explored cities that I've lived in so that I've gotten to know them pretty well. I knew Santa Monica pretty well. I knew San Francisco very well. I knew Boston. OK, but Boston's a really good example. It's like people always ask me, even at the time, like, where should I go? And I'm like, I have no idea, dude. If it's not around Northeastern University, I have no idea. Right. Like what, what you want me to tell you at all. Or if it's not like where some of my dumb drug addict friends live around the city where I'm taking like trains to them, you know, uh, other than city. that. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, so I'm like, I don't know. You come to Northeastern, go to Connor Larkins or something. I have no fucking idea. None of these places are even open anymore. So I, I think I owe it to myself to maybe be a little bit more adventurous and maybe, you know, a high tide will lift all boats with with Micah and I, because if she's feeling the spirit, I'm feeling the spirit. I think we can like. We can't reinforce ourselves. We have to get into like the better mood and reinforce in the more positive way. And I think we won't regret it. Like who goes away for a few weeks to like and does all those things and comes back and you might have missed things and it might have been tiring and you might have been longing for comfort and longing for home in your bed but you come back and are you do you really regret it i mean that's the that's the thing i often think about is the one thing i do regret is i probably not probably i could have traveled three or four times more than i did just for work i was invited to go to all i was invited to japan constantly i probably could have been to japan more than a dozen times. I, I was invited to the Tales Festival every year when I was at IGN. That alone. Oh, wow. And I, every time I was like, no, 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 because I didn't want to go. So I was like, I don't want to be on this fucking airplane. 
But in, in reality, it was probably a stupid thing. I was invited to go to all these studios from Housemark to all the, you know, in Sweden and Finland and in Eastern Europe and Italy. I remember Assassin's Creed events in Italy and in France and in Morocco and Egypt and all. And I'm like, meh. <laughs> and certainly okay. Australia, New Zealand, mm. Hawaii, all over Canada, Mexico, Brazil. I mean, these are all trips I said no to free trips. But I just, for me, I was just, that wasn't a comfortable life for me. It's like, I don't want to, if, if I could do like the beam me up Scotty shit, or if I could like convince people that it was worth it to go for like two days and come back, which it's really not, then it's like, it's just not for me. It's just, I just understand it's not for me. It's like, we were talking recently on one of the episodes about like the whole idea of the grand tour and the way people used to see Europe and how cool that is. But I just feel like I'm in a different era now. I'm not that curious about things I can easily see the deepest 4K documentary about and put on a fucking VR headset if I want. And goes, it's like, I'm good. I don't, and I don't even want to see it that way anyway. It's like, it's like you can't really understand what it is to be in space until you go to space. But we often rely on proxies to tell us what it's like to take pictures and videos. And we kind of uh, we immerse ourselves in that way. And it's the same way I feel about seeing the rest of the planet or under yeah. the ocean or in the sky or whatever. I, I don't feel like I necessarily need to be there because it's not 1600. And <laughs> the only way I'm going to see, it's not that I'm, I'm never going to see Paris. I'm never going to be able to imagine what, it, what the hell anyone's talking about. It's not, I can just go and like, I can read an extensive Wikipedia on it. I can go to the library and get any book I want on it. I can watch documentaries. I can learn the language on, on a, on an app. I can, you know, it's like, I listen to the music, read the philosophers, I can do anything I want. So I, so being there, it doesn't, it seems limited. It's like we're humans. We actually, we've outsmarted this mode of existence. We don't need to be anywhere. <laughs> that is an interesting yeah. perspective. Yeah. And then a lot of, you know, a lot of that's true too. I mean, you go to a French restaurant, taste really great French food by a French chef, you know, type of thing. Yeah. You learn French yeah. from a really shitty detached teacher, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, we all, like we did. They're all from it France. Smells like cat food. It smells like cat food. Yours did? <laughs> that, 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 yeah. What was her it name? Sounds about right, actually. I can't remember. <laughs> I remember ours, but I'm not going to say. Don't be mean. Oh, you don't want to call her out. No, yeah. no, no, no. Lily is French teachers are all from France too. It's crazy. They're all, Spanish teachers are typically not from Spain or from Spanish speaking countries, but. Yeah. Ours know. was just a regular woman from Massachusetts. Oh, she was. Not, okay. of, not of any descent. She was just <laughs> a regular Caucasian woman. Very nice. Spoke Spanish like nobody's business, but it's like we, this is what we got. We don't even have like an actual like <laughs> Spanish speaking person. It's another lady thing. who learned it really well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't. Uh, let's just say I, I don't know how I took French for so long and know so little of it. Like for years. I, I took you. it for years. Years. Me too. All the way Same. to college. That's the craziest oh, you part. Took it, I took you it took at the it college much level. Longer. Oh my God. Yeah. That's why, crazy. I, that's why I kind of underplayed <laughs> a little bit because I can read it a little bit. Like, yeah. Dec I can understand it. Like if you look, if I look at things, it, yeah. I can kind of be like, all right, I think i understand somewhat what you're saying here i could pick out some of these words and these phrases or whatever but speaking it it's a hard language oh my god dude i Much wouldn't even different. i was so embarrassed i remember i don't know why but i was so embarrassed of like you got to like pronunciate and do the accents and i didn't want to do it you know nah too much effort right bonjour. you know i'm like no it's like well bonjour like that's you know that's how i would say it like, like, like brad American. pitt yeah, uh, Bongiorno. Where's Bongiorno? Yeah, Bongiorno. I actually hated that scene. That's like the only scene I hate in, in the what? movie. In Glorious in, Bastards. In Glorious Bastards. Oh. Um. Anyway, anything else to say about this topic? Did we go to everyone exploring new cities? I think we did. Everyone touched this mm -hmm. topic. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap it up then, my friends. This was fun. We actually recorded two episodes today because we just we recorded the, the Last of Us as well. So good work, everyone. Um. Thank you for your time. It was fun. Uh, we had a great time in Houston. Thank you for everyone that came out. I hope you guys enjoyed the show as much as uh as we did doing it and thank you again for your graciousness for your kindness for your support i mean Dagan had said something earlier about like you you guys are putting out all the effort like you're, you're traveling you're doing all these things but and you're paying out for all these things but you're also paying for your ticket and we really appreciate that as well it's like we're not i i said this before and i, I really want to underline it it's like i don't look at doing live shows as an entrepreneurial endeavor like i do the company at large we don't make that much money. I mean, I think we, we profited maybe $10,000 and I haven't paid anyone yet. <laughs> you know, like I haven't paid any of the talent. I haven't paid the videographer. So like we're not, we didn't make very much money at all. 
And it's not, that's not the idea. The idea is to like hopefully break even, which we've done. And for everyone to kind of, to meet each other, for us to meet them, to have a good time and kind of, I think it's important to break out of my comfort zone once in a while. It's like Micah said earlier, I think I, I want to do that too. I, I need it. I think I needed to be jostled awake a little bit because not only did I leave my media job where I just stopped traveling completely after traveling constantly. So I just got away from that. Then I lived a few years where I was traveling still a little bit going here and there and still seeing Dagan and doing everything. And then after the, and during the pandemic, I just stopped going anywhere and you almost have to kind of start the engine again and get it like warmed up. And I think that, you know, in some way the, the Butler show did that. The Richmond show was very comfortable because I didn't have to go anywhere. And then the Houston show really kind of put me a little bit more like way more out of my comfort zone. And then we'll go overseas next. And that's going to put me more out of my comfort zone yet. Um, Cause then I'll be the foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> Get Jesus ready. Christ. Um, but thank you again out there. You, you, it was, it was so much fun and, and we appreciate you. And yeah, I wanted to do a themed one and it's good that you think that's a good idea, Dig. I think we can do them more often. I'm not going to title it in such a way that it's, that anyone will know it's themed, but you'll know when we talk about, about sure. it, that they're bound together. And I do think that it would be a cool way for us to, to discuss these things in the future. Yeah. Um, smart. All right, let's go around the horn one more time. Micah closing comments. Yeah. Um, just one more realization I had about travel. A big part of it was realizing that travel sucks when you're poor. And like every yes. vacation we ever went on was a road trip. So every time we came to visit my mom's family, it was a 10 hour drive in a sedan with my family, you That's know, tough. stuff like that. And I re I think I'm realizing not to sound materialistic, but I'm realizing travel doesn't have to be so horrible when you're not living like in this, just, just living in poverty basically. So I think that's a big realization for me that I wouldn't have thought of, honestly, without this topic is, yeah, I'm softening a lot towards seeing new places because it doesn't have to suck to get there. Right. Exactly. And I, I must say that, and I, I said this to you, I just kind of had the realization you were, you were just, I mean, you're always just a very pleasant companion. That's why we get along. We just kind of are simpatico, but I was just, I remarked to you, like we were just sitting kind of people watching on the side, eating our witch, witch sandwiches, waiting for our delayed plane. To, and I was just like, you know, this is very pleasant. I think that's exactly what I sound like. You're just very, it's just very pleasant. Like to have a, a, I'm usually, I was often alone in those situations, you know? So like, it was especially boring. You're just like, mm. you're looking at your phone, you're fucking waiting. Things are Great delayed. Point. You want to fucking kill yeah. yourself. Um, <laughs> it's lonely to it, travel it just su- Yeah, it just sucks. You know, like it's just a, a real slog. Travel just, I, I really do long for a new way to travel. And that doesn't have to be some, we, I wish we just had bullet trains in the United States. I know that it's a, it's everyone makes fun of us for not having them or gets mad. It, the United States is huge. Um, I don't yeah. know if you guys knew that. And it's 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 a little more complicated because all the different states and our lack of a totalitarian government and all those kinds of things to get to wrangle all these things together. But we were saying it, I think, when Maddie couldn't come because of the plane and we were like talking about trains and all this. We weren't going to actually do that, but he was looking at it and how long it would take. And I was saying I would take a 12 hour train from Richmond to Houston. No problem. And if I had a sleeper car, that would be awesome. I would totally be into that. Just yeah. put your bag in there, just like set yourself up and hang out. I would totally do shit like that. And even faster travel than that, just via train, I think would be really cool. I'm not afraid of planes. I've flown, you know, a billion times. They don't scare me. It, it's just the whole mode of travel seems so obnoxious. The whole thing to the airport, through the security, to the gate, on the plane, fucking lowest common denominator kind of shit. No travel <laughs> etiquette, right? Like all the kind of stuff. People don't know how to board a plane. People don't know how to get off of a plane. People don't know how to act on a plane. It's, it's just, to me, I just, I want to remove all of that. I wish that we lived in a, the Europeans are lucky in that regard. Chinese, you know, sure. Japanese, other places, yeah. they're, they're pretty fortunate that you can get around pretty efficiently by rail. Your countries are exceptionally small, um, with the exception of China, it's a very big country, but it, it's just, it's a different way of traveling. And that's what I kind of lament. I wish, I wish it were practical to do here because if it were, then I'd probably go certainly more places around the country at the very least. Although I've been to most places around the country just in my travels, but just incidentally, I, I like the idea of that. Um, but the whole cattle car mentality of, of, of air travel, just American domestic air travel, fuck that, man. I hate it. And it's, it's, it's really the barrier. Uh, it's that plus time, just too much. And the, by the way, these planes can go faster. I want everyone to know that. They can go faster. They choose not to because they use too much fuel. Yeah. Um, so that's what pisses me off. I think the most is that these things could haul ass. 
and they choose not to. And obviously we can't even break the sound barrier because of the noise and all that. Although I think I wish that they kind of figured that out too. But it's like, come on, guys, let's get this fucking going. Why are we going so slow? You know, (laughs) it's like all these things are going four to five hundred miles an hour. That's totally ridiculous. Uh, I just that's the thing that bothers me, too. It's like, fucking get that going, Iceman. Let's fucking kick this thing in the gear. (laughs) I said Mav. Digging closing comments. Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much to all the LSM faithful that came out to see us in Houston. It was a pleasure. You guys are my heroes. And um, yeah, it's so nice to kind of see and hear you once in a while because you're doing that with us all the time. So to kind of flip the script is very gratifying. And Michael was talking about, you guys talking about that land, that bumpy landing mm. in the beginning of the mm. episode. I just read real quick, planes are only traveling typically commercial airliners from 130 to 160 miles per hour upon landing. I thought it was faster than that. Because I worry about those wheels and I worry about those brakes. Can I? Because that's a lot of stress. Can I say something to you? This is going to make no sense to people. This is just one of those things I, I'm going to admit, right? Because one of the yeah, like, crazy sure. games I play in my head, because like, I play a lot of these weird like OCD games in my head, <laughs> is that when you know, you're at like the most catastrophic risk of death when the plane is hurtling at 40,000 feet and you're going at full speed, right? So when you know when you're getting close when you're beginning your approach and they start to slow down and, and go lower in my mind, I'm like, it's getting safer and safer. And it's going and when in fact, actually it's the landing is one of the most dangerous parts of, of any air travel and taking they off. Say, yeah. Um, like planes, as mom always says, planes want to stay in the air. They don't actually want to come down. Like something has to go wrong for them to want, like to just plummet out of the, out of the sky out of nowhere. But uh, so like when I, when you start seeing the lights and you come down below the clouds, I remember this in San Francisco because in San Francisco, you fly in over the water and you land like right on the water and just come in that way. So, and uh, which is like so neat. And I remember feeling like, okay, I feel a little more safe now, even though even at 400 feet, I'm going to fucking die when this thing crashes. (laughs) I feel the same way though. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. I don't know if anyone can relate to that, that like in my mind, I'm like, it's getting a little safer. It's getting a little safer. (laughs) If we crash from this, from this level, maybe I'll live, you know, kind of shit. I think the same way, it doesn't make any sense. And you know, by the way, I wanted to say we have an embedded, I don't know if you guys saw this, we have an embedded sponsor in our show name, my favorite beer of all time. Will Stella sponsor this show? Mm. No. Mm. I mean, the least we could do is try. We could. It's uh, right in the name. Talk to our ad reps. I think they're trying mm. to sell the show as we speak. So that would be nice. That would be pretty sweet. There's a leg up. Maybe. Dustin, closing comments. Closing comments. I have, let's see. A that beaver looks of... fucking psychotic or whatever the hell that thing is. I know. It's... <laughs> He's so cute. <laughs> Dude, Holly got fully dripped out. She got some Bucky <laughs> shorts, a shirt, and there was a little necklace that was really funny. And I was like, you got to get the necklace all too. the gear. And then she wore all of it to the arcade that night that we went to. <laughs> she was totally set with Bucky's. Anyway, I'm really excited. I'm going to play Call of the Mountain tonight. Cool. I've got a few hours now. Dive in some PSVR. And uh, that's it. I have nothing left to say. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I will, <laughs> we'll go into this much more in Sacred Symbols, of course, but um call the mountains really impressive like mm. I, I i i think it's pretty extraordinary actually and uh, i think you're gonna like it i played it for about an hour i actually moved the psvr unit the psvr2 unit up into our loft here which we never use we have like a big tv and all of our console like a whole set of consoles and um space like a couch or in our loft here upstairs but we we're always just together so we rarely split up and conquer you know uh, divide and conquer so i i moved it up there because i think the dogs are getting a little disturbed like they don't know what's going on. I'm like yeah. standing up, not looking at them and like just <laughs> swinging my arms around and doing and like you can feel like treble, like moving around my feet and like rush doing his concern, like wine. <laughs> so I so I had to get I had to get out of out of, out of view yeah. of them, but I'm excited to get more into that myself. Um, we thank all of you out there for your love, kindness and support of all things. Last stand constellation, sacred symbols, defining Duke knockback. Of course, thank you so much for all of you that came to Houston to see us. We'll see you again soon for another live show we'll have more to say about that in the coming months um as far as i understand we have some details to work out um ben was ready to talk about the next show before we even did the, this show but i can't process more than one of these things at a time like i can't have more information so now it's time to ingest that new information so we'll have that and we'll be able, be able to work off that soon but um in the meantime hope you enjoyed our episode of constellation we'll see you next time until then goodbye
See ya. Constellation is a product of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez, and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 